paid on this wallet. So you'd be able to keep everything safe right in the hardware wallet and still trade. This is big, big innovation. We had lots and lots of press around it. I'm really looking forward. I'm, I know a lot of our users have been using it and they think it's amazing. I'm really looking forward to us scaling it and really getting it out there. And of course, Gate.io, centralized exchange with over 3 million users, over 400 plus trading pairs, just so, so many functionalities like spot trading, margin trading, and futures trading so that you can, you know, make the best use out of uh, what it is that you're looking for from your crypto trading experience. But today is about talking about GateChain. And so let's talk about the development process. Uh, you know, like I said, it mainly solves the issue of private key destruction, loss, and digital asset theft. How does it do that, do you ask? Um, there are lots of different things. I'm not going to go through all of this. You can find the slides. I will, I will post them online so you can go and find that. But we've been developing this since 2018. So it's been a long journey. Uh, and it was last year, 2019, that we released GateChain. And then we went through a series of test nets. And I'm really glad to say that in Q2 of 2020, we were able to launch the mainnet. So, um, you know, the reason that it took so long is we wanted to make sure that everything was going to be really solid. And indeed, now it is. And so talking about the mainnet. So like I said, the most important thing is private key loss and asset theft. And those are the two biggest issues in the industry. People forget their private keys all the time. And just recently, we were talking about this in the panel, um, the Nexus um, CEO got hacked for $8.5 million on MetaMask. What if you could prevent that? You know, if someone like Hugh is not able to safeguard his MetaMask, then what chance does a regular user have? And so that's why we created GateChain. On GateChain, you will have a standard account. And so this functions just as any other blockchain, uh, you know, wallet functions. So it's quick pay. You cannot revoke the trade and you cannot retrieve the assets with, without uh, the private keys. But we also created a vault account. And this means that the stolen funds or the private keys can be recovered. And this is the very, very big innovation, which, you know, is going to enable uh, absolute, uh, you know, absolute security for users. So what is this vault account and how does it work? Uh, so we created our own RTM, we call it revocable transaction model uh, for this vault account. And uh, this means that you're able to revoke the transaction. Now it will be written in the tax ID, revocable pay. Uh, the address is also, you know, going to be, uh, it's also going to be noted that, uh, you know, this, these kinds of transactions are revocable. Uh, obviously we recommend that you make transactions only between your vault account and your own standard account and not with other people. Uh, and so basically what does this mean? This means that if any of the funds or taken away from your vault account, you're able, you will get a notification and you will be able to, you know, click revoke and then it will be sent over to a retrieval address. It's and not you will be able to retrieve these funds. That's what's so revolutionary about GateChain. That's how we ensure absolute security for our users. And that's why I think it's going to be really, really big. So like I said, as you can see here, uh, it will be written irrevocable pay or revocable pay according to whether you're using a vault account or a uh, standard account. And so, yeah, I think uh, this basically explains everything. We will be transferring the assets to this, uh, you know, retrieval account so that you're able to get the assets back. 
We will also have additional features as, as if like just being able to ensure absolute security is not enough. We will also have access to uh, multi-sig account management, which means that you're going to be able to have several different people validate transactions. This is really important, uh, especially in business, because sometimes you want to make sure that your uh, partner uh, or, you know, uh, your boss uh, approves a transaction that's being made. Uh, and just in general, in your personal life, if you make transactions, uh, you know, with a, it's kind of like a joint account, you know, you make sure that the other person uh, is going to be there. And it's also a safeguarding measure. We also have assets transfer. So you'll be able to automate some of these payments. Also going to have the hardware wallet is going to be enabled, well, is enabled with GayChain. And um, that's how we're going to be able to ensure almost 100% asset security. So like I said, uh, there are lots of application cases for GayChain. There is the individual's asset management, so that for all of you retail traders out there, uh, you guys will be able to benefit from keeping your funds on GayChain and you know ensure like absolute security. Then we will have the legacy or grant auto release, which will enable you to you know be able to make some of those automatic transactions. And then there is safe storage for financial institutions, and we have seen a lot of financial institutions be very interested in Bitcoin. We're already speaking with some very interesting parties and entities who want to make sure that everything is safe. And this is something that we are going to be able to ensure for them. So there will also be POS mining, very highly decentralized, and they'll, it'll be available POS proxy mining, participate to the future, going to have lots of super nodes and delegation and you will definitely have like double profits for loyalty nodes. Uh, this is, uh, we're really focusing on building a strengthened decentralized network. A lot of these protocols, you know, they're decentralized, but you know, they're really controlled by a lot of these super nodes or super delegates. And uh, in fact, if all of these super delegates to get together, you know, sometimes there's only maybe like 21, they all get together, then they can, you know, they can stage an attack. Uh, this will not be our case. We're looking to have hundreds, if not more, uh, super delegates and super nodes. So we will also, in terms of performance, we will have very high performance with a handling capacity of over 2000 transact transactions per second with over 170 million transactions per day and the block confirmation time will be four seconds long. So very, very quick. So uh, GT is the GateChain token, which we launched in uh, April of last year. With GateChain token, you're able to get a lot of great, uh, you know, use cases on the Gate.io platform. So you're able to get a VIP level, you're able to get discounts, you're able to uh, get benefits, uh, and uh, you're able to get priority access to our staking programs. And in general, we often buy back a lot of the GT and burn it so as to, you know, prevent too much inflation. But what is really interesting about GateChain token is that is the native currency of the GateChain blockchain, of course, and it will be used as payment uh, for network charges and as a POS equity mining bonus, et cetera, et cetera. So we are going to be looking for blockchain optimization. We'll automatically prevent empty blocks uh, so as to save you know, a lot of resources. We are also automatically going to be adjusting handling fees so as to avoid junk trading. And we will also have an enhanced resistance to Grover's algorithm and Shor's algorithm. So there is comprehensive support. It's available right now today on a desktop, on your phone, and also, of course, in the S1. If you uh, have uh, ordered one or if you're looking to order one, we will be launching uh, to Global really, really soon. So what so are we, we looking uh, to do? We are, you as know, we, we are <laughs> yeah, running out of time, please speed up a little bit, okay? So that we can...
part. Yeah. Being um, so this is, this is the last part. Uh, this is about like the future and what the gay chain future holds. We are looking to increase uh, the speed of the cross chain. Uh, so we are going to be launching a lot of cross chain assets like ETC and ETH and Cosmos, especially and DOT um, so that you can get all of that. Uh, you'll be able to implement a one tap chain issuance feature. So you'll be able to stake just with the click of a button and there will be a decentralized trading system that will be launched actually very, very soon. Thank you so much for listening to me. And if you have any questions about GateChain, I recommend you come and ask us on Twitter. You can either tweet us at gate underscore IO or directly at Gate. Yeah. Thank you very much, Maureen, for your speech. I mean, they, this speech mm. today has made us realize the potential of uh, blockchain empowering finance. And also, great honor here to, to have this speech, knowing more about the gates and the gate uh, chain related ecosystem, right? So this is going to be blockchain's biggest strength towards a mass adoption. Thank you very much. See you next. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm, so a sustainable business model is able to attract the participants of different roles. For us, it is important that the crypto markets can expand its use, use cases beyond just exchanges. So holders can try out new applications with their tokens and more capital. Uh, speculators and value investors will be drawn to crypto business. Exchange will also need to come up with useful trading features. So what is the future of exchange like? So we will hear the answer from Ethan, CEO of Biki Southeast Asia. Let's welcome Ethan. Hey, Ethan. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. This is Tracy. So it's your time now. All right, thanks. Um, Yes, uh, so uh, hi everybody, my, uh, and thanks Tracy. Um, my name is Ethan, I'm the CEO of uh, Biki Southeast Asia. Um, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. So I, I feel a little bit latency here for your uh, connection. Or maybe you can switch a okay. better connection. So here it's a little bit slow. Ooh, if okay. you can change it, because your voice ups and downs so sometimes. Oh, okay. So yeah. it's not about loud. Or okay, no, it sounds better. So maybe you can try again. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Cool, cool. No, right. it's, it works. Yeah, yeah perfectly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, yeah, thanks, Tracy, and and. Thanks for having me here. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I'm, I'm here to actually discuss with uh, everybody about the future of uh, development exchange. So first of all, I'm Ethan Ng. I'm the CEO of uh, Biki Southeast Asia. And without further ado, I'll just um, give a really short introduction about um, what's Biki Exchange. Uh, so we are relatively still new in the market i think we are two years plus old right we established in 2018 june to today we are we have uh, three million registered users we have a hundred thousand daily active users and uh, we have over three thousand community partners and two hundred thousand um, active community users right so um to date we have uh, more than 300 plus uh, trading pairs and I'm really excited to be here to to discuss with everybody about uh, what's next uh, coming up uh, from exchange developments, right? So traditionally, we all know that you know exchange actually provides the liquidity and users will go in to trade primarily, and so that's that's what we know from the traditional market. But ever since like um, the DeFi space. Uh, a lot of um, users are actually looking more into staking, right here, looking more into liquidity mining, and that causes um, a huge shift in the demand, right? And that's what I'm gonna discuss about shortly. Right, so, I mean, um, I just took the screenshot from DeFi Pulse. I think everybody already know 
the numbers and is still have been rising, right? In fact, I think we're still very much in the earlier stage uh, in, in the DeFi space and there are many more product development and more market demand that's going to be changed in the near future, right? So just now I was mentioning about staking and liquidity mining. So the first uh, subject I'll be touching base on is liquidity mining, right? So um, what is basically liquidity mining? So users basically when they provide liquidity, they get to earn trading fees paid daily in their accounts. And uh, this actually solve the liquidity issue and this also allow users to mine for rewards as well. So how, how it actually works is um, on the left hand side, we have the projects and the projects early investors and they are community members, right? And so when they provide liquidity into the pool, um, ordinary users, right, in Biki or uh, Biki's community will come in and they will also uh, contribute to the liquidity, liquidity pool or they will also purchase um, uh, tokens or sell tokens to the liquidity pool. So in this case, right, um, both parties actually have their needs and we serve both parties over here by providing 50% of the trading fees in the um, tokens of whichever it is to back to the early investors or the project community or the project themselves, right? And also users who provide liquidity, they get to earn 50% trading fees as well, right? And um, so we vested uh, a lot of resources to get this done. And um, amazingly, you know, um, we have a lot of very good feedback from projects as well as users that uh, this is a very good tool for them to use and also to mine for more uh, tokens, right? So generally how it works is pretty much almost the same concept as Uniswap. So I'll use an example, like when you put 100,000 USDT and you put 100, sorry, 100 USDT and you put 100 USDT worth of Tron, for example, right, into the basket. And so what, ha what happens is when you actually place it uh, on the Biki's platform, what it does, it actually uh, places quotations uh, in the order book. And so whenever the prices is going up, it will help you buy more Tron tokens. And when it's going down, it will help you sell Tron tokens. And over the long period of time, you actually um, get to benefit more with ROI as well. And on top of that, you are already earning from uh, liquidity mining rewards. Right, so generally this is like uh, how it happens. So you can see the quotations in your order book and those will not those transactions will not happen until uh, practically the prices uh, hit the market prices hit uh, your quoted prices and when that happens then your transaction will go through and then you will actually mine for the liquidity rewards right so um yeah, this 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 method is actually dollar cost averaging as well and so it generally gives you a lot more uh, returns in your ROI as well, right? So you save, so this, based on the, the feedbacks that we got from our community, actually it save a lot of gas fees for them. And also there's no bots absorbing liquidity uh, in decentralized exchanges. And also it gets the projects and their early investors and their communities to be engaged a lot more. And they will be discussing a lot more as well. Right, so the next thing I want to touch base on is um, staking. So I think um, over the last few months, we have seen huge interest, you know, especially in uh, the decentralized world on staking, right? And we have seen a lot of uh, different programs on staking as well. And so um, we actually uh, tested this on um, many outcomes and also many situations. And so for because staking is generally um, this your principal is uh, is guaranteed, right? And then uh, your income is stable, and it, we actually support uh, multiple tokens. So, like the most recent one, we actually do um, thirteen percent APY for USDT, right? So uh, these are the few examples. Like uh, for FAO, we have annual annualized use at four point zero six percent. And then we have DOT at 3.36%, TOMO at 1.75%, right? USDT is, if you 
the USDT is 2%, but the newest one is 13 and Fortron is 1.2, 1.12%, Ethereum is 0.63, and BTC is 0.35%, right? So all, all of this actually benefits the user a lot if they are less of a trader and more of a holder, right? So I just mentioned about liquidity mining, and I mentioned a lot, uh, I mentioned a bit about staking, and then moving forward to 2021, right? So I think uh, there'll be more developments in the staking programs, and I think there'll be more sophisticated uh, models towards liquidity mining as well. Uh, generally, you know, the, the po this direction is moving towards more of getting close, uh, uh, closening the gap between communities, early investors, as well as the project into a very nice ecosystem f to benefit each other, right? So um, we are coming to 2021 very soon. So I think the upcoming new launches of projects and uh, new trends are definitely going to hit us. And of course, we are all very delighted with the 20,000 uh, mark of uh, BTC. I think it's a new milestone, right? And many more to come in 2021, right? So, and I think, yeah, that's it. Um, I'd like to thank Tracy and also everybody for your time. Yep, back to you. Thank you, Ethan, very much for your speech here. And uh, to be a trained setter in the crypto world, you will have to always keep up with the time for seeing the upcoming trend and take quick action, right? So thanks again for sharing with us here, Ethan. Thanks for your time. So hope to see you thanks, soon. Thanks, Tracy. Take care. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. As the demand for exchanging digital assets grows rapidly, so crypto exchanges are becoming more and more important. So they are the bridge between the primary and the secondary markets and the link between project teams and the blockchain investors. So next, we will have Al Chu, VP of Global Business, uh, Blue Helix and HBTC, also Jade Chen, VP of ChainUp, uh, partner of King Hash and the Origin Pool, uh, and Frank, business manager of uh, Cashier Rest, and Andrew, yeah. head of project relations at a White Beat Exchange. Uh, and the last one uh, is uh, Melin, head of overseas business of Bbox, and uh, Nisha, founder of Wizard X, to discuss technology trend in blockchain digital currency trading platforms. So how will trading platforms, top tiers in the industry, grasp the opportunities in the trade in the new era? So let's start the discussion. Thanks guys very much for participating with us, uh, staying with us at this panel. Uh, please say hi. Hello, Elsa. Hi. Hello, Jade. Hey, hi, hey hi. Frank. Hi. <laughs> also, hi. yeah, Meilin and Nasha. Thanks very much. So let's go straight forward. This, this is a big group, right? So five people here. Uh, first of all, thank you very much again. So uh, I will go straight to our first question. So my first question here is trading is a most uh, prevalent and uh, frequently interacted element in the crypto world. So how to provide the safe asset custody and earn users trust have become the top concern for all players in the field of crypto exchanges, right? So any insights on how to create a positive brand image and uh, forge a bond of trust with users for trading platforms? Let's start with Elsa. So Elsa, hi, see you again, right? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Tracy. Yeah, yeah, thanks for your question. Mm. So, uh, yeah, a short introduction. Uh, Elsa here from Blue Helix and HBTC. We're doing the uh, Blue Helix SaaS and white label solutions for partners who want to set up an exchange. Mm. And also, HBTC.com uh, is our self managed exchange. And back to the question. So, for us, right, uh, it's the most important medium of value exchange in the blockchain industry. So, cryptocurrency trading uh, not only keep like, the user data or so user trading. Uh, platform, but also uh, is quite, uh, important to users because they are mm -hmm. they are treated as security as, as their primary consideration. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of uh, exchange security, 
HPDC um, has maintained a record of zero incident in terms of stability and security within three years, mm -hmm. which is the best proof of our security system as well. Uh, and we have completed 6,000 plus iteration of upgrades and 136,000 um, plus system builds and zero incidents in 99.99 .99 high availability since launch two. So we maintain a perfect system reliability. So we can see, only can see this developing, launching and system building efficiency in like top tier um, the internet companies, for mm -hmm. example, Amazon, Alibaba, and Tencent, and so mm -hmm. on. And because uh, HPDC is our self-managed system, so it's part of Bluehills Group. So Bluehills Cloud has gained a rich experience in user needs and product optim optimization. So that's why how we can support and build the uh, trust between uh, users and uh, the trading platforms. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we all know that a lot of uh, centralized exchanges, uh, they use the uh, centralized custody or like say third party custodian. Mm -hmm. um, it will affect a bit about uh, the trust between the user and uh, the platform. So for us, right, we have uh, integrated our HBTC chain, which is doing uh, the decentralized key generation. Mm -hmm. So our uh, custodian path is a way we have parallel. So one is centralized centralized and one is decentralized. Mm -hmm. So and uh, for the centralized part, we can provide a proof of reserve. So all the users can use the macro tree to validate their assets on our platform. Mm -hmm. And for the decentralized, they can the assets can it's just easily not going to the platform. This people still can trade. So we believe that uh, with the web standardization and confines go uh, along the way. Mm -hmm. So custodian and especially for the decentralized custodian will have a, a good way to go. Yeah, that's my point. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. Also, again, so Jade, if you have anything like to share with us, uh, thank you. Uh, for me, when we talk about the the image of uh, exchange platform, I think that we need to think about the globalization and both the globalization and the localization. I think for training platform to ensure the safety of the i of the access custody service is the most basic. To build a brand image, I think that we need to uh, think about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. First, maybe we need to think about a glo globalize our business to build a global, global image. Since that uh, for the short introduction for China, we was we we found it in 2017 mm -hmm. and we own a, a number of branches. As present, we have such branches office in Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, and also we have Seoul, Beijing, and Shenzhen office. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are preparing for more office in the world. It is what we do for the globalization part. We also hold some some a lot of events a lot of event, uh, all around the world for to to let more people know about train up or know about our mm -hmm. partners as some trading, trading platform. And now we also uh, like more offices to make a local image for our uh, to our local service mm -hmm. to ensure that more we we do a lot of things to 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 make things that obey some local regulations, mm -hmm. and and also that at the same time that we have a lot of partners all around the world mm -hmm. and such as some media partners to make to 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 have a lot of uh, articles and PR agencies to help us to build some local image mm -hmm. I think that it, it is our uh, our experience to build some globalization and localization part for mm -hmm. for these things thank you very much and Andrew mm, your takes on this Sure. So firstly, a quick introduction. My name is Andrew and I am Head of Project Relations at Whitebit Exchange and it's a great honor to be speaking here. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you. <clears throat> so I should say that it comes as no surprise that there have been growing concerns and even fears on behalf of the users when it comes to how secure their funds are with the exchanges. Mm -hmm. And the reasons behind this are rather obvious. Lately, we've had a lot of news of exchange hacks, persecution on behalf of regulators, even exit scams of various magnitude. And mm -hmm. when thinking about this issue, we should ask ourselves, for example, what is one of the main reasons behind people preferring decentralized exchanges rather than centralized ones? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. The DeFi hype aside, I would say that uh, it is the fact that there is simply no need to trust because at any point, you know exactly what is happening with your funds. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to my point that companies earn users' trust when the users don't need to trust blindly. The best brand image an exchange could and should work on when it comes to addressing users' concerns is full transparency, no matter, no matter their size mm -hmm. and range. Yeah. After all, we should remember that blockchain and crypto are here not to replace the traditional financial market, but to transcend it. Mm -hmm. And I would like to share just a couple of insights. Uh, they are rather simple, but they are encoded deeply into our mission at Wildbit Exchange and our motto. Yeah? Okay. So those are show your face, be open about who you are, what licenses you operate under, who runs your company. Mm -hmm. Second, embrace necessary regulation. There is simply no way around this, and it's better to be clear, as our motto says, and to help form this market rather than eventually become its outsider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have strong cybersecurity, run bug bounties, involve trustworthy companies to run audits. Have an excellent support team, which is always there to help explain and solve problems. Mm -hmm. And if you're facing issues that are limiting your users' operations, let them know about what's happening and always keep them in the loop. Mm -hmm. And this is, I would say, the level zero of what an exchange should do. And if all those check boxes are fixed, I believe you're on the right path. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. So Frank, uh, so if you can share your insights with us. Uh, hi, this is Frank from Cash Real Estate Exchange and thank you for inviting us to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as a centralized, centralized exchange, uh, maybe my view is somewhat different from Andrew's view because mm -hmm. uh, in South Korea, uh, the every exchange have to be certification, means IASMS certification. Uh, the only 10 exchanges have the uh, IASMS certification, and which means that information security management system certification. Mm -hmm. So every exchange is certificated by government. So it is very important to follow the government's rule and guidelines yeah. to maintain their business in South Korea. Okay, so my view is first of all, and obviously I think transparency and communication with users are most important mm -hmm. thing. This aspect, I think operation and sales team is very important because the team communicate with users directly. The trust cannot be built on without any effort and it takes long time in general. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to thank for our operation and sales team first. And next, as I, say, as I said before, following government's guide and rules are very important. Cash rest exchange is mm -hmm. safely storing most of customers' assets in separated cold wallets, mm -hmm. which just few executives can access. Uh, it also following the government's rule and guidelines. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that is the very basic thing, but also very important because the fact that one exchange following the government's guidelines sincerely can create a, can create a positive positive brand image by itself. For mm -hmm. example, like I said, ISMS, uh, when South Korean users finding the exchange which they wanted to trade, they first search that the exchange got the certifications or not. So mm -hmm. it is the very important point for users. Mm -hmm. And finally, building a network with other company can be a good way to keep customers as a safety and create a positive brand image, I think, mm -hmm. because the exchange alone cannot protect assets uh, perfectly from outside attacks. In case of cash arrest, we have partnership with Signa from Kubit X, which are offering AML solutions to us. Mm -hmm. And we also keep searching some able security company to cooperate with nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Meilun from uh, Bbox, so your insights? Yeah, hi, I'm glad to share my thoughts on this. Um, so regarding how the trust levels of um, 
users to platforms, I think Bbox has done a great job. We have a very solid team and we lean towards a steady growth. So our customers are trust us, um, trusting us to actually use uh, this platform because of the tech and the AI background from it. Mm -hmm. We actually went on a global compliant route uh, from the beginning. And uh, the strategy from early on is that this, um, you know, with our uh, VQF licenses from Switzerland and um, Estonian licenses from crypto, token to token. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this actually grows our customers' trust um, to us. Okay. And this is a global effort because we also have tried this um, from, I think, from three or four years ago since, uh, to, from South Korea to Japan. Uh, and we're having this licenses pending. Um, but to our customers, this would be a route. And I think if you're doing anything crypto, you should uh, notice this. Um, and actually put your efforts into being compliant with the traditional finance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is kind of a core competency in our industry. Mm -hmm. Future later on, especially tonight, we broke all time high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it. And uh, another part of this um, uh, trust level would definitely come from your trust level with this um, uh, tech team. Mm -hmm. We have veterans from uh, both AI and blockchain in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, notably, if we have Chinese audiences, they're from Huawei. Okay. Uh, high level from Huawei and veterans from OK. And mm -hmm. uh, this would be effectively the trust level, the stone for our customers, what, uh, how they would want to go with us, mm -hmm. because they would trust us to, as an as a platform, we will not do anything um, technically, we mm -hmm. will not fail them. Mm -hmm. And also for this AI and uh, a blockchain form, uh, platform that we have, mm -hmm. uh, this high alert that we have, this combined uh, mm -hmm. platform of AI and blockchain that we will actually be alerted before everyone else. Mm -hmm. So if we are having grid trading or we're having our perpetual contracts, our customer will not have their loss actually occurred because of what they call a needle mm -hmm. down or up. Mm -hmm. And this is how we actually gain the trust um, from our customers. Mm -hmm. And um, just to say that we have uh, kept a record of zero accidents since the beginning, mm -hmm. which is uh, a rare thing for uh, bigger platforms like us. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. So, Nisha uh, from Wizard X, right? We'd like to have your yeah. insights. Great. Yeah, sure. Um, see, I think uh, I believe technology and product, all of these are important. But one of the key differentiators I've seen, which uh, helps build immense trust in your community, is the founders and the teams coming in front of the users. Mm -hmm. uh, and these examples are in front of us. Take uh, Justin Sun, for example. Uh, he, was, he, he came in front of the people. He told about what they were building. And people looked up to him as uh, this uh, founder who's building a blockchain pro project. And they all uh, you know, uh, backed the founder. Mm -hmm. uh, coming forward to, and, and uh, Tron was not like the first blockchain to launch uh, yet it could make inroads because uh, the founder came in front of the people mm -hmm. uh, same with I would say uh, let's take CZ for example from Binance Binance was not like the first exchange to launch uh, but just because the founder was in front of the audiences the audiences trusted that exchange mm -hmm. i've done something similar with wazirx in india we were not the first exchange. in fact we were the last ones to launch uh, about two years ago mm -hmm. and today we are the biggest because i decided that i should be in front of people rather than being hidden from the audiences that were using our product so when founders come in front of people their users uh, users tend to trust them more because ultimately you're dealing with money and while you can use products and you know brands uh, when you when you come across people I think that trust factor just uh, increases tenfold. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I would lay this whole uh, trust building as uh, founders and team members coming in front of people and you know being real instead of just being a brand, mm -hmm. be a be a person. 
I think that affects a lot in this whole trust building exercise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you very much for sharing the insights on this question. So let's go next. Uh, as we th- uh, talk about, so few guests sharing uh, some concepts about the transparency sorry. and commu- so. Sorry. Yeah, I- I'm really sorry. Can I just quickly address what Frank has said? Yeah, just to avoid misunderstandings. We were talking about regulations. Yeah, and Frank uh, said that he disagrees with me on that point, but it seems like we're both actually on the same side here because. I have said that we also are strong believers in regulations and that it cannot be avoided and it must be embraced, embraced at the right time before it is like too late and you become an outsider in the market. So. Well, we talk about regulation on the second question. So you will have time to sure. discuss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for, for the for exchanges, so, uh, you, you guys are sharing some concepts about transparency and also communicating with your users, right? So there has a, so that there's a, something lies between users and the products. So how to offer a more well-rounded product metrics or develop new growth drivers for trading and improve user experience on top of providing basic trading functions? So this is my question number one. And also, um, I also would like you guys to share about the, the relevant regulation in your country. So let's start from outside. I know right now you are in Singapore, right? So I would like to yeah, know more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I, I share a bit about uh, the questions. So uh, because we all know that user growth is another uh, very important topic when we are uh, talking about security and the user growth as well. Mm-hmm. So because actually backbone by Blue Hill is called. So what we're doing is we keep sharpening our products uh, in different mm-hmm. uh I mentioned, for example, we have spots, perpetual swaps, options trading, OTC, uh, leverage, margin trading, ETF, and so on. So we keep shopping our um, products in different level. And uh, for Bluehost Cloud, because it's a SaaS service provider, we have about uh, 300 plus partners uh, globally. For example, I say Japanese license exchange Xdata, the global uh, station is using our platform, mm-hmm. and also the Chinese net. Uh, Chinese, the fan tokens recently done the Binance and also in South Korea is Hepico. Mm-hmm. Hepico Global is also our, our own clients. So for us as a service provider, in a, in one way, we will keep in, keep shopping our products and the receive all the feedbacks from the retail trading. So that's why how we can gather all the um, pro, um, product optimization and mm-hmm. all the different angles from the user operation as well. Mm-hmm. So we need to uh, collect the lead needs from the ground. And just now you mentioned about the regulations because recently with all the big news is uh, Singapore, the DBS exchange, uh, DBS exchange is launching. I think this week or early next week. Yeah, this uh, is uh, because uh, for HBDC, we're also one of the exempt exchange uh, in MAS in Singapore as well. We are, everyone's uh, looking for the license. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, most of our clients, uh, if they are registered in Singapore, we also help them to with the license application, uh, with the compliance and legal terms as well. So uh, uh, we all know that uh, OSL in Hong Kong is recently received the first license in, in Hong Kong. I think it's a very big uh, move. So yeah. I think Singapore will soon issue the first license and uh, uh, we, everyone is looking for it. Uh, mm. We don't see any hope for this year, but I, I hope that Q1 next year will have the new license uh, coming out. I think first yeah. one will come go to DBS. Yeah, DBS now is uh, the one... Uh, in the exam- exemption period, and they are only open to the uh, the, the, le- the the institutions and the the clients, uh, the institution firms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, Jade would uh, also like to have your yeah con- insights. Hello, Jade. You here? Can you hear me, Jade? Hello. So there has some uh, connection problem. Hello, Jade, you hear me? Okay, let's go Frank first um, of all. So Frank, uh, would like to share yeah. your ideas, yeah. Okay, as the industry is changing and developing, the user prefer- u- user's preference is changing also, as you know, from margin trading to staking services, uh, and nowadays, DeFi is very booming. So there has been so many tries to attract users. We have tried many ways too. Uh, when we build a new service, we mainly fo- 
consider three, fac three factors. Uh, the first thing is mm -hmm. always regulation and government guide guidelines. Mm -hmm. If you had a chance to see the Korean exchanges, you may notice that there are not any margin and future trading in their services. Okay. That is because our government blocked it. Before designing the service, it is always important important to check whether the service can be contained in the boundary of the regulation or mm -hmm. not. And the second thing is the market trend. Like I said before, there has been always a core keyword and trend in, in this industry. Recently, mm -hmm. it was defined, obviously. Uh, as a centralized exchange, it was very hard to follow the defined trend, but we are trying to follow up the market trend in some other ways, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, find some good project uh, about the DeFi project. Yeah, that is the way how we try to follow up the market trend. Mm -hmm. The third thing is gathering atten attentions from new users. Uh, as the regulation is coming, we are mainly focusing on these new users who have not invested in crypto before. Mm -hmm. In this aspect, we are getting up the portion of stable investment products. The new users who are recently coming with regulations are more likely conservative than before. Mm -hmm. We think like this ways to attract them. We are designing products using stable coins like USDT or CKRW based mm -hmm. on fiat money. So the new users can enjoy a better and some more stable return than a bank skip giveaways. Mm -hmm. So that is our view. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, Andrew, uh, your insights on this? Of course. Yeah, so uh, the market we all work in is, of course, a difficult one because it has not yet been established in itself. Yeah, so it, it, it really changes quickly and therein lies the difference actually between crypto market and traditional finance mm -hmm. where in the usual situation the company would be able to plan their development and marketing a couple of months ahead half a year ahead and use for that proven measured and working instruments a blockchain company should always be able to stop and change the strategy in reaction to changes in the market yeah mm -hmm. And as of right now, you cannot survive in crypto if you are rigid and inflexible. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, this like ability to quickly analyze and introduce new products is crucial to attracting new users for an exchange or a trading platform. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it requires good brand management, product management, and considerable development resources. Just mm -hmm. as an example, with Whitebit, we have a roadmap of products that we are planning to launch and have always wanted to launch. A good example of such a product would be margin trading that we have uh, that has gone live this summer. Mm -hmm. However, apart from these, we also launched several additional products. For example, a P2P platform called Bitcoin Global and a decentralized exchange called WhiteSwap. And none of those were initially in our roadmap. They both became our quick reaction to what was happening in the market. Mm -hmm. The decentralized exchange was obviously in uh, reaction to the DeFi hype and the P2P platform was launched after the news of many P2P platforms coming under attack and getting banned in various countries. Mm -hmm. And we are certain that it is exactly the right timing uh, that was the key point in the success of those two project, project products. Uh, and another thing, thing I wanted to point out is something that we call user's journey. It is a strategy of attracting new users that we are using, and it is a complex of activities that we do for our users with the purpose of firstly, educating our existing user base about the new developments in our exchange, mm -hmm. and secondly, familiarizing newcomers with what Whitebit is and how it works. And it includes anything from AMA session to educational videos to competitions, quizzes, staking uh, events, and so on. Mm -hmm. And this has proven, proven rather popular with the community because it employs gamification as the driving force behind creating a new generation of experienced exchange users. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to quickly address the regulation issue, uh, as I said before, uh, like we are believers in the necessity of regulation. And our motto says why it is clear, which means that you have to be transparent and clear and you cannot do that without complying with the uh, current government uh, guidelines. Mm -hmm. And it is also important to be able to work with the government while they are working on regulations in order to be in the loop and in order to help create those regulations mm -hmm. and be 
uh, in the center of events. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Meilun, your insights on this? Hello. Hello, Meilun. Are you here with us? Uh, okay, let's go uh, Nisha from uh, WizardX. So we we'll love to have your voices here. Yeah. Uh, so I think the first part of the question, I, I oh, would uh, I mean, simply. Can you hear me now? Hey, oh, yeah. You can yeah, go. Yeah, on. yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. You go on. I'll be okay. the next round. So uh, okay. Okay, Nisha. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think the first part of the question, B, uh, as an exchange, we usually try to just listen to our users and, um, you know, build what they ask for. Mm -hmm. rather than us having a roadmap. And I think Andrew Andrew put it uh, really well that the ecosystem changes so much. It's really hard for someone to predict what would need to be built, let's say, three months down the line or six months down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, so we figured out the better way is to just simply listen to what users are asking for. And uh, feedback comes in different uh, you know channels, Twitter, uh, your Telegram uh, groups. People just keep asking for features and uh, whatever is the most requested, we just build it. And we've done that time and again. Uh, and we realize that uh, that's like the best approach. The second part, which is regulation, I think I would want to touch a little deeper into that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I don't know uh, if many people know, but uh, India has had like a, a love and hate relationship with crypto for a long time now. Mm -hmm. And uh, regulations have been more or less, uh, I would say, um, less clear there's not been any regulatory clarity in india mm -hmm. so while we've been trying to get regulations uh, positive regulations in the country we realize that regulators are usually slower than uh, the markets so usually your innovation comes first and then the regulations come in mm -hmm. uh, so what we we have been doing is a bunch of us exchanges in the country we've gotten together mm -hmm. and we are forming sort of a self regulatory organization and the idea is that even before regulations come, can we follow a set of guidelines, all of us together, and show the regulators and show our country that we can self-regulate. And this there's a set framework that we follow, which you can then adopt at a, a national level. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to self-regulate first and then you know present that to our uh, regulators, mm -hmm. saying this is what we are already doing. How about regulating us in that direction? So yeah, uh, at least in India, we are going towards the path of self-regulation instead of waiting for regulations to come in mm -hmm. so that uh, that self-regulatory body can be seen like a model uh, for the regulators to adopt in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing the current situation in India. It's uh, a great thing. Thank you very much. And uh, Meilun, your turn. Hello. Hello, can you yeah. hear me now? Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. connecting. I was yeah, so I was saying I was really um, agreeing to what Andrew just said, the gamification of the whole platform. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, uh, you know, the India situation also gave us some light. And uh, for BBOX, our uh, traditional finance growth customers are one of our top priorities. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in the past two years, we actually have formed strategic partnership with LSE, which uh, is a uh, London Stocks Exchange Group. Um, with their global partner plan. Uh, we look forward to opening up both traditional finance world and blockchain industry and make everything mm -hmm. more convenient to institutional players when they uh, look up to this uh, play field and like to be part of the players. Mm -hmm. In a product, product wise, we actually have released uh, great trading and DeFi mining with uh, what um, other people have said uh, mm -hmm. this year's um, hot stars and released uh, custody and margin trading on top of mm -hmm. the more convenient for institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, so the products were chosen by a moderate uh, route for our customers where uh, you have more options with uh, actually better trading experiences. So um, I think Bbox is actually one of the earliest to actually have algo trading with AI strategies mm -hmm. that actually minimize your uh, risk and uh, maximize your gain at the same time, but mm -hmm. uh, not as perpetual contracts where people basically just go into uh, like 
play lotteries.、Mm -hmm. So our customer actually benefits with steady profits and smaller risks.、Um, yeah, I, I think that's the route we're going on, and that's the current answer we have for this question.、Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.、Uh, sorry, guys. So as we are running out of time, so I'm sorry to say, so we should stop this panel since we need to、uh, connect other the following guests. Okay. So thank you again for participating in this panel discussion for sharing your insights here.、Uh, hope to see you soon. And、uh, thanks again. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 So for this panel discussion, the exchange of ideas so gave us a better understanding of exchange, right? So I'm sure there is still much to anticipate from exchanges, and let's stay tuned. So that was a brilliant speech, right? So the explosive growth of digital economy is calling for change in every aspect of our industry. So how it, how will exchange promote the upgrading in traditional finance, and how will blockchain and financial technology be fully integrated? So this is a paramount importance. So let's welcome Alicia Gao to deliver her speech on how do financial technology and blockchain truly merge, and how will it change to move traditional finance on chain. So let's welcome Alicia. Hey, Alicia. Hello, everyone. Hey, it's、um, your time. So, okay. Thank you.、Um, so, so this is Alicia,、uh, senior partner of KuCoin. So,、um, I'm in charge of KuCoin Global Relations. Today, I'm gonna share how to achieve true coupling between fintech and blockchain for for you guys. And、uh, it's also a great honor to be invited here to share some of my thoughts over the industry developments. So before getting to the point, please join me going through the following three sets of data. Okay. So,、uh, first one, the first set of numbers:、um, total crypto market cap, which more than doubled over the past twelve months. We can see in the chart at the beginning of 2020, crypto market cap was slightly hanging below 200 billion, while now top 600 billion by today. That is a 300 percent net increase. And、um, the next one, moving to moving on the second set of data that illustrates and. Upward trend in total total value locked in DeFi, we see it skyrocketing from the year opening, um from sixty uh six hundred and fifty million to fourteen billion as of December fourteen, as a strong over two thousand percent year on year increase. So, um. So with the third set, let's zoom in from the macro to micro and take a look at the figure relates to grayscale investments Bitcoin holdings. Starting from May twelve, twenty twenty, the latest Bitcoin halving, about nine hundred Bitcoin are mined every day, while grayscale's daily increase in Bitcoin holdings is about nine hundred and fifty since since then. The crypto assets managers' daily collecting is bigger than the Bitcoin daily production. So,、um, while grayscale's, uh, uh, so so grayscale's currently holds over five hundred and sixty thousand Bitcoin, about two point sixty seven percent of total Bitcoin supply. So, what are the aforementioned? Three sets of data showing us, if not the complete big picture, I would say a damn good sketch. With、um, DeFi's popularity and traditional institutions like Grayscale tapping into the crypto market, the signs of recovery are way more obvious than just detectable. So, for crypto、uh, currency investment has been pushed to an all-time higher ever since Bitcoin keeps hitting a record high, like just like today.、Uh, Google search trend echoes such signs, and 
ever and even demonstrate a stronger momentum of people beginning to take notice of cryptocurrency. In 2020, the whole world has seen its ups and downs, well, downs mostly despite that the crypto world in this year might have seen more ups and excitements. There are inseparable challenges and bottlenecks. The total crypto market cap now tops 600 billion, while Bitcoin takes 380 billion, accounting for more than 60 uh, 60% and either from the sense of vision, such predominance of one single crypto assets might be a problem. Judging from what has happened with the traditional internet industry, monopoly and uh, could hinder the industry's rapid, rapid Develop, development, given that it's the nature of hot money and accordingly other resources in chasing the big players like Bitcoins in our case in here. So which obviously will cause troubles to new projects when, rising, when raising funds, no matter how innovative they are, and it's difficult to them to garner the attention they need. So as uh, the most friendly platform uh, for new develop to, for newly developed projects, we have um, in endeavoring to find hidden gems in the crypto industry and help them to strengthen from multiple aspects, technology, uh, community, eco partners, and we are determined to keep empowering more. One by one, we believe it will ultimately facilitate mass adoption of blockchain. So um, to open up to more crypto gems, we provide multiple listing channels on KuCoin, such as Spotlight, community voting, um, direct uh, listing, Taking Spotlight as an example, we've now seen eight projects being launched on the platform, completing their initial token sale and uh, fundraising. According to a data from CryptoRank, uh, KuCoin Spotlight projects have an average return rate of over 400% ranking top-notch among all the trading platforms that provide such services. So we have built 16 different language speaking communities, including but not limited to English, Italian, Russian, with nearly 200,000 community members, which will be able to foster a rich soil for promising projects anger for community support and other resources. I think we are uh, one of the most globalized exchange with the most widely distributed uh, user base in the world. And we currently support over 250 tokens including mainstream currencies, stable coins, DeFi, cross-chain projects, and other fields. In addition to providing a global user base and community for high quality projects, we also provide a general and uh, extensive infrastructure. We are offering a number of crypto related financial services fiat to crypto, crypto to crypto, futures, uh, staking, lending, token sale, and so forth. With the, the, with the diversity of product lines of KuCoin, users have more than adequate tools to capture both alpha and beta returns, and meanwhile, to properly hedge against risks. So let's uh, talk about KuCoin futures. Since its first inception, KuCoin Futures has been our outstanding products, especially in this year. It now supports 17 contracts based on USDT margin and coin margin contracts and covers perpetual futures and quarterly delivery, delivery futures. 
So far, we are proud to have 600,000 happy and loyal users trading futures from more than 120 countries and regions all over the world. KuCoin Futures has achieved a stunning rapid rise of trading volume that's increased by 420% from the very beginning of this year. In terms of users' experience, we've delivered an industry-leading trading experience ever on the app and providing a light version to make it more user-friendly and easy to start, even for newcomers. In regards to industry-leading uh, innovation uh, and development, we are the only exchange that supports the Level 3 full order book message pushing on full matching engine data, which guarantees the transparency and also the fairness of every transaction and data. And our margin trading products, pioneering exclusive 10 times cross margin, which supports uh, 23 tokens and 44 trading pairs. Unique C2C lending market, which creates ultra high returns for users with low risks. KuCoin uh, margin traders distributed in over 200 countries and regions and trading volumes has increased by 200% in this year. So in the future, we will continue to improve the margin trading experiences, increases product function and supports uh, more cryptocurrencies. So, um, so we are only fertile soul for already good blockchain projects to flourish but will also become an incubator for promising ones to first roots and then blossom. So we are determined to empower projects from multiple dimensions, naming underlying technical, underlying technical environments, business application scenarios, initial, initial token distributions, token circulations, user and community building, and future chain governance. So please make no hesitation. Let's just, uh, let's join hands. So find the next crypto gem on KuCoin. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you. So your speech is really inspiring. So help us better understanding the possibility of integration between exchanges and the traditional finance. Thanks again. So with a fast growth in digital economy, I'm sure that exchanges will be more deeply integrated with traditional finance and the blockchain will be made a simple tool for everyone. So thank you again. Hi. Mm. Yeah, so uh, in recent years in the cryptocurrency trading market, uh, many exchanges and the financial institutions have shifted their focus to the growth of financial derivatives. So we often hear heated discussion on how to expand the derivatives category, identify new user needs, and make smart investment. So let's welcome Nimord to give us a presentation theme, well is a smart money, blockchain financial derivatives, and identify new user needs and expand the derivative category. Uh, welcome, Nimord. So it's your time. I'm Tracy. Great to be here with you on the this speech. Hi, uh, thank you. I'm actually not talking about derivatives, but rather more uh, on ramps and uh, mainstream adoption. Uh, so maybe there's a, a, a mix up in the speakers. Um, so hi everyone. I'm I'm Nimrod Lehavi. I'm co-founder and CEO of uh, Simplex. Um, I started. I'll, I'll just give a kind of a brief history about myself. I um, started my way in crypto, um, I think it was around 2011. Uh, I think like many of the people who started uh, interacting with the ecosystem back then, it was uh, a lot of technical interest, uh, some, you know, some part uh, ideology, uh, looking for alternative uh, uh, financial systems, more uh, transparent, more inclusive, uh, something that will hit uh, uh, 
that we'll be able to touch more more lives and more people. And uh, Simplex uh, main task from day one was enabling more users to hit uh, to touch the the crypto space to uh, to make crypto more accessible to everyone. Uh, to make it simple, basically, to make it uh, uh, super simple for people to buy. When I initially wanted to buy Bitcoin, it took me something like a year before I was actually able to get my hands on some uh, on some Bitcoin. Back then, credit cards weren't even an option. It was considered the, the holy grail for uh, a long time. So we, we started working uh, in 2013. We started the company officially in 2014. Uh, which makes us one of the um, uh, veteran companies in the space. Uh, we started providing the service in uh, December uh, 2014. And uh, today we are uh, serving uh, hundreds of partners, uh, exchanges, wallets, outlets, enabling them to serve millions of users globally uh, all around the world and enabling uh, them to pay uh, billions of dollars, uh, millions of dollars a day, in uh, new money into to the crypto ecosystem. I think that, you know, specifically today, after we all uh, broke the, the, the new time, the new all time high, finally, the, the 20K uh, psychological barrier, I think it's clear to everyone who's uh, outside of the crypto space or whoever is newer to the crypto space that it's happening. So everything we've worked on for almost a decade is it's going to happen. It's no longer something that just a few geeks are talking about. And in order for the crypto ecosystem to be a multi-trillion dollar uh, ecosystem as it should and as it would be, one of the major things, one of the major challenges is easy on-ramps. As part of it, it's always uh, uh, easy off-ramps as well. I think that uh, in order for mainstream users, both uh, uh, private users and corporations to actually take part in the ecosystem, they need to know that it's as easy to get out as it is to get in. They want to know it's easy to liquidate, easy to interact with, uh, with the fiat ecosystem, with the banks. Currently, it's still uh, not, not exactly the case. Uh, but in order for this ecosystem to grow from the current half a, half a trillion dollars, uh, a bit more now with the all-time high, uh, to tens or hundreds of trillions of dollars, one of the major things is on ramps. So I think the uh, the opportunity here is huge, and the work here is huge. And what we're doing, uh, the fact that we chose from the get go to serve the entire industry uh, rather than try and hog users to ourselves, we're platform enabling other companies to uh, access the users or enable users access to uh, to the market. Uh, we are providing uh, predominantly uh, uh, credit card, uh, Visa and MasterCard, uh, fully safe uh, uh, payment trails. We've recently added SEPA, so Europeans are able to wire money in much larger amounts. Um, we are also adding, uh, in a few weeks, we'll be adding SWIFT, so users globally will be able to wire uh, and make purchases via wire. Uh, both on-ramps and off-ramps. Uh, we are also working on adding uh, additional uh, credit cards, um, UnionPay, JCB, uh, Yandex. Uh, we're also adding on uh, adding uh, uh, ACH transactions within the US. I think that one of the, the major uh, features that we are able to provide right now is uh, banking. Uh, providing with uh, the users of our partners with a very friendly, uh, crypto-friendly banking. Uh, you're able to open a bank account, uh, everyone except American citizens for the time being until we're completing our uh, licensing efforts in the US. So everybody's able to open a bank account with us. It's a fully functional bank account with your IBAN, uh, international bank account number. You're able to open it, you're able to use it, you're able to make purchases through it, you're able to sell crypto through it. Um, Again, unlimited amounts. Well, once you've uh, completed the onboarding of the account, the transactions are very cheap and uh, almost immediate. So I think this is something which is uh, pretty big for the ecosystem. Also, our partners are able to connect to it with, uh, with an API. So basically, you're able to view your fiat balance from within your favorite wallet or uh, exchange uh, as long as they're, uh, they integrated these features. You're able to 
see there has a connection problem with our speaker. So let's wait a bit to see if we can solve this technical issue here. Uh, or maybe let's play a video again. Yeah, so we're back again. So you can continue your keynote. Okay, I'll give okay. the time to you. Yeah. No worries. I'm back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're all good here. Oh, okay. it seems like your your frame is frozen right now. So maybe you're trying to connect to a better network if you have. No. Yeah. Now, now you can see me? You can see me really moving, or uh, yeah, the frozen? the frame is frozen, so I cannot uh, see see your movement here. Uh, but but you can hear me because mostly. I can hear you. People yeah, I can hear you properly, but I just uh, cannot see the picture there. Yeah. Yeah, I think well, maybe I'm because I'm sharing the the deck. It doesn't really matter. I mean, mostly mm -hmm. it's uh, or or okay. is it bad? Uh, would you prefer to continue the the speech without the keynote? If you can do that. Yeah, I think I can continue. So. Sure, sure. Let's try again. Yeah. Let's try again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Should I start? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah now it works. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. Just okay. So sure, sure. Where, where yeah. I dropped off or? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Go ahead. So, um, as I, as I started uh, saying, when you're uh, processing credit cards, uh, th there are risks that come with the territory. Uh, credit card fraud is a huge issue uh, in every ecosystem and even more so in um, an ecosystem such as ours, where if you are, um, if someone is uh, uh, committing fraud with a credit card, he's basically not losing anything, he's just gaining the, the crypto that he stole. Uh, that's why Simplex, since day one, we're uh, putting our money where our mouth is. We are underwriting a transaction, and if we enabled it, we are 100% behind it. So if it ends up in a chargeback, uh, we keep you whole, meaning that you're never in loss. Uh, I think it's a super important uh, um, feature for this ecosystem, ecosystem specifically. We're going to continue providing these uh, payment trails uh, and other payment trails in as immediate format as possible and as uh, safe and secure format as possible to everyone. So both the user and the exchange or wallet or whoever is selling uh, is always uh, safe and secure. Um, as said, we're also adding uh, additional payment methods uh, for multiple jurisdictions. Uh, again, trying to provide them in the, the fastest way possible. So uh, when we are handling uh, wire transfers, uh, we're trying to find the, the fastest way possible that we're able to add them. We're trying to make it as global as possible. So we're trying to find a uh, uh, different solution, more localized to different jurisdictions. Uh, we're working on some very large, very underserved jurisdictions right now. Um, and again, the, the banking feature at its core is enabling users globally to open a bank account, wire money to it in whatever format they uh, prefer, 
and then use the money from that account and vice versa, sell crypto into that account and later on wire uh, the, the money from that account to the regular account. Uh, a very important aspect of this feature is the fact that it's an IBAN on your name. Um, as whoever tried to move money around from a crypto exchange or a crypto company to his personal account, whoever tried that has noticed that the bank uh, has some issues with that. Banks are very risk averse. They're afraid of uh, crypto transactions. But when you're making a transaction from uh, another account on your name, the, the flags are different. So the banks are less worried. They assume correctly that we have performed the proper AML and proper KYC on the money in your bank account. Hence, they're less worried and more likely to uh, complete this transaction. Another uh, important part is uh, issuing debit cards with uh, recently became a principal member of the Visa network, which enables us uh, issuing debit cards to our partners' users. Uh, so if you are one of our partners, you're able to start issuing debit cards uh, with your branding powered by Simplex to your users. Your users will need to have uh, to have opened a, a bank account with Simplex, and then they're able to interact with this bank account through their uh, issued debit card, globally uh, usable. Uh, very interesting. Uh, very interesting also on the on the branding side. So. Our mission has always been and still is to just enable anyone anywhere to buy anything, any digital asset that they want in any form of possible. I think that over the past uh, seven, eight years that we've been operating, we've uh, succeeded quite a lot in, in creating this, um, this move in making the purchases of crypto something which is less agonizing, something which is more accessible. I think that now with uh, uh, PayPal stepping into the market, it's, uh, it's a super interesting influence on the market. Uh, I think it's a great step towards more adoption. But, you know, there are about 9 billion people around the world. Uh, PayPal serves uh, hundreds of millions. It's only the beginning. Our intention is to make it accessible to everyone, everywhere, in any form of the basic and enable them to buy whichever digital asset that they see fit. Uh, we take great pride in the fact that we are ourselves um, enabling millions of dollars in new money into crypto on a daily basis. It's uh, something that we're very proud of, and uh, we're even more proud because we're taking care of the fact that it's all super clean, regulated, uh, free of uh, danger assets. Uh, Every dollar that is going to Simplex is filtered, scrutinized, and we make sure that we enable the good players more and more, and we don't let the bad players uh, get in. Uh, I think it's super important for us to grow uh, a safe ecosystem to work in, especially as more and more uh, mainstream users are stepping in. Super important for us to make it a safer uh, uh, environment for everyone. Um, I think that we are, as, as the, 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 the market leader in uh, on-ramps and off-ramps, I think we have a great responsibility in setting the standards of what should be the, the quality of the service, what should be the level of the service, uh, what type of services make sense to the users and whatnot. So uh, that's it. I'm happy to share uh, this information about Simplex, even more happy to do so on the day of the new all-time high. Uh, just proving my point of uh, making it easier to access just brings more users. More users bring more usability to crypto and makes all of us happier. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nimor, for your sharing here. We really learned a lot, and your speech gives us, us a understanding of financial derivatives and also uh, we believe like financial derivatives are playing an important role in the digital currency market today. Thank you very much for sh sharing. And I believe, yeah, there will be more uh, diversified products that will enrich this market. And let's see what will happen in the future. Stay tuned. Bye. Appreciate your time. Bye. -bye. Bye.
So apart from financial derivatives, there is another thing that we care about. That is a massive adoption of blockchain. So safe to say that real-life application of digital assets is always a goal we are trying to achieve as industry develops. So this respect, how will the integration of tourism with cryptography fuel the wide adoption of cryptography in real life? So today we have Juan here to tell us with his presentation, real life application of digital assets. So integration of cryptography in tourism and how this will fuel the wide adoption of cryptography in real life. So let's welcome Juan. Hello, Juan. Hey guys, how's it going? Hey, this is Tracy. So good to have you here. So it's your time now. Oh, great. Um, can you guys all see the presentation? Yeah, you can start your presentation. Yeah, I can see that. Awesome. Wow. Good, good stuff. Good stuff. Awesome so, yeah, first back, of all, um, <laughs> oh, good. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, just get it on, get it on the travel move here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, first, first of all, I, I know we all wanting to to travel again, so it's probably a good topic to to talk about tonight. Um, so my name is Juan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Traveler.com. Um, my background is in, in travel tech and obviously I've been involved in blockchain since back in 2015 now. So it's been quite a while. Uh, today is a big day. Uh, we've been waiting for this moment for I think almost 30 years now. So yeah, congratulations again to everyone holding Bitcoin and, and everybody that obviously uh, believes in the space as this is a, an important achievement what, what we just saw today. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, um, is Travala.com. Obviously, as a project that has built, um, you know, an alternative for online travel bookings, and also a project that is proven to be uh, a great vehicle for uh, mass adoption of cryptocurrencies. And this is probably one of the areas where, um, you know, uh, us as a community, or as, as, as you know, the, the, the founders and, and the teams that are building in this ecosystem, um, is important to focus on the fact that, you know we all going to benefit from um, adoption of cryptocurrencies as a whole. And here's where we believe that um, obviously Travel.com could play uh, an important role in, in the future. What we do today is basically, um, you know, what we consider to be the Web 3.0 OTA, uh, online travel agency. Uh, back in the 90s, we had players like Booking.com and Expedia that were very innovative. Uh, then in, in early 2000s, um, we have the second generation, what we call the Web 2.0, with the likes of um, Uber and Airbnb, obviously on the travel space. And now what we're trying to do is to go a step further to actually uh, decentralize the travel booking experience, both from the consumer side and also from the travel supplier side. Um, what we offer today is uh, over 3 million travel products uh, across the world, uh, reaching 230 countries, over 90,000 destinations globally, with prices up to 40% cheaper than what consumers will find in, in traditional or online travel agencies. Uh, we managed to gain a lot of traction um, with over 150,000 monthly active users as we speak. And obviously, thanks to the backing of, of Binance as well, uh, that helped us um, achieve this, this type of growth. Um, the next phase is we're building a lot of decentralized uh, applications um, within the, the travel uh, tech or the travel space. Uh, and for that, obviously, we're building on top of, of Binance's smart chain. What we believe, as I mentioned before, is that travel is um, an ideal path for mass crypto adoption. At the end of the day, we all travel. We probably haven't traveled so much in, in 2020. Uh, for obvious reasons, um, but we're also very confident that, you know, as travel restrictions start to ease um, post-COVID, uh, uh, we're going to see an absolute tsunami uh, of travel bookings uh, and uh, a significant increase of travel demand, um, particularly due to the pent-up demand that has been built over, over 2020. Um, we want to offer uh, a frictionless travel booking experience um, so that any consumer uh, can come and, you know, book the travel uh, on Traveler.com, whether they're looking for homes, hotels, flights, tours and activities, 
uh, or any of the products that we offer today, um, despite having a lot of blockchain functionality on the platform, um, you know, since day one, we focus on offering, you know, uh, great UX UI so that any user, including mainstream users, um, can be introduced to, to, to crypto as well. Uh, in a way, we think about it as a, a frictionless on-ramp into crypto. Uh, servicing not just the crypto and blockchain community, but any user uh, or mainstream user that obviously um, we can manage to introduce to to cryptocurrency uh, through the Traveler.com platform. Our roadmap so far, so we have, as uh, many of you probably know, partnered with some of the you know biggest uh, travel brands in in the world, from Booking.com to Expedia, Agoda and up to 15 different travel suppliers. Most recently with uh, Viator's uh, TripAdvisor to add over 400,000 tours and activities worldwide as well. Um, but until today, we have managed to integrate just over 3.1 million travel products between hotels, flights, homes, and activities. Uh, we're working on many more uh, partnerships or integrations. And we're also looking at you know the next travel verticals that we will offer on the platform. This includes cruises, car rentals, packages, and a number of other travel products, um, with intention of building um, you know the largest decentralized OTA in the world in terms of you know the number of travel products that we will eventually offer our our users. From a technology point of view, obviously we build um, a lot of. Um, uh, we put a lot of time into our product, both, you know, the obviously the website, uh, desktop and mobile versions, the native apps and, and the different products that we run, both for our consumers and our, our travel suppliers. And we're also doing a lot of work with Binance in terms of, you know, different integrations like Binance Connect, Binance Login, and, you know, uh, utilizing the, the wallet infrastructure and a number of other things that we are building on, on Binance Smart Chain as well. Uh, going forward, um, we will continue to improve the digital wallets within the platform and to build uh, the decentralized business models um, for, for, for the travel platform uh, on Binance and Smart Chain. So yeah, we're very excited about you know, building a platform that can actually um, give that level of freedom to travel suppliers, whether it's a small you know, boutique hotel or a property owner, uh, an apartment owner, or you know, obviously the the, the bigger um, travel suppliers, uh, we want to offer them a, a fair way to on the booking economy. Um, as you probably know, um, existing online travel agencies they control a lot of the booking volume that goes through these um, you know small travel suppliers. Uh, in some occasions, you know, paying commissions anywhere between twenty and thirty percent. Um, we want to move away or, you know, help them move away from that monopoly, that control from these centralized online travel agencies by building a technology that will allow them to, to freely interact in, in a peer-to-peer -peer level uh, with travelers, with consumers, uh, which obviously will, will help both uh, in terms of transparency, pricing, and, and, you know, the whole user experience uh, for both the consumers and, and the travel, travel suppliers. Um, an important thing to touch base on is, is the market itself. Uh, this is perhaps something that we've seen with the likes of Airbnb. Um, you know, we, we are following that, that natural evolution of, of you know, P2P commerce uh, in terms of, you know, we've seen with the success of Airbnb how consumers are a lot more uh, open towards, you know, platforms that offer better pricing, more transparency, uh, and so on. Um, what we want to do here is take things to the next level. And what we're learning is like the size of a market that's already, you know, one of the largest industries um, at the moment, you know, uh, estimated to be worth over $2 trillion by, by 2026. Uh, we believe that that's going to be significantly larger uh, when you consider the actual decentralized uh, travel booking space. Uh, exponentially larger for, for a simple reason. Um, when a, the technology that we're building is open to everyone, anywhere, anytime. You know, we, we can have any property owner, uh, any apartment owner, 
Uh, think about Airbnb. They have over 7 million listings of, you know, individual property owners and property managers. Uh, there's over 2 million hotels globally. There's, you know, tens of millions of travel products uh, that we are aiming for uh, that could be used by billions of users at a global scale or on, on a P2P level uh, through a decentralized platform that eventually will also, you know, have a decentralized governance model and and so on. So, yeah, very excited about the market itself. And obviously, you know, coming out of um, the, the, the COVID period, also very excited to see um, how the demand increases. Um, the backing from Binance, obviously, is a, is a key part of, you know, a roadmap going forward. Um, we do have several integrations uh, already. Uh, you know, Binance users can uh, log into the Travel.com platform directly with their Binance account through the Binance login and Binance Connect. Um, we're running and planning uh, multiple uh, core marketing uh, activities and campaigns. Um, we're working on several integrations. And yeah, obviously, uh, there's uh, an easy way for, for millions and millions of Binance users uh, to easily, you know, use the Travel.com platform to book travel in a in a very seamless um, seamless way all of these um um you know the advantages that we offer on the travel.com platform are obviously powered by our native token uh, the ava token and um one of our main use cases is the smart program and this is one of the pain points that we identified in the travel industry uh, in regards to loyalty and rewards um we all been exposed at one point or another to, you know, existing loyalty and rewards programs from, you know, whether it's uh, air miles, whether it's, you know, the booking.com genius program, uh, the level of transparency is obviously not what, um, you know, we were told uh, or what it was supposed to be. Um, there's been a lot of um, pushback from consumers in regards to the actual value of existing loyalty programs within the travel industry. So we wanted to fix that issue from the beginning. And we came up with the, the smart program, which is probably one of the um, you know, most significant use cases of, of the travel.com platform. Uh, the smart program allows users to enjoy up to 10% uh, direct discounts and gift bags uh, on any travel bookings just by holding the ABA token, as well as bonuses you know, up to 24% uh, paid year, depending on the amount of, of AVA that they, they lock on, on the Travel.com platform. But it's proven to be um, a great mechanism, not just for our community and our token holders, and obviously for the token economic itself, but also to incentivize continued growth of the platform by offering you know, a tokenized loyalty program that adds real value to users uh, as they continue to use the platform. Uh, as well as obviously liquidity through the rewards and so on. Uh, by default, any user that comes to the Travel.com platform um, and makes a booking, uh, even if that user is not part of our smart program, uh, is going to receive 2% gift back on our native token AVA. This is uh, something that we use to introduce crypto to mainstream users. Uh, now anyone can come to the platform, make a booking, and immediately, whether they need crypto user, whether they pay with a credit card uh, or, or, or any other payment method, they're going to get introduced to, to those tokenized um, loyalty rewards through our native token. This is one of the main use cases, but obviously we have several uh, use cases. Uh, ABA is, is, is a multidimensional token uh, with proven utility uh, from obviously booking payments to rewards, uh, spending in shops. We have integrations with multiple payment gateways and, uh, you know, it powers uh, a number of other use cases within the platform. But perhaps the, the smart program is, uh, is our most significant use case for, for the ABA token. In terms of the partnerships, um, yeah, we've managed to um, break that barrier with, um, you know, a lot of, um, well-known uh, multinationals um, like the likes of Expedia or Booking.com uh, partnering with us and allowing us to basically bring all the travel inventory, all the travel products to the crypto world again. Expedia was a perfect sample 
of a partnership that we announced uh, a few months ago. Um, as many of you, as many of you might know, Expedia tried to accept uh, Bitcoin payments um, back in 2018. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, it was uh, a bit too hard for them to manage in terms of uh, the actual payment processing and so on. Um, so the fact that we were able to, um, you know, secure this partnership and make all the hotels and all the properties um, bookable again with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, just, you know, we, we offer over 35 different uh, payment methods in, in, in the Travel.com platform uh, at the moment uh, in terms of cryptocurrency payment options, uh, apart from our native token AVA. Uh, this includes obviously TRX and and um, USDT TRC20. Um, you know, the, the TRX, for example, is, is, is one of the, um, you know, cryptocurrencies that we, we first integrated uh, at the beginning because we want to use the platform as a way to showcase um, use cases for, you know, some of the main assets in, in the industry and make sure that, you know, together we, we help in, in driving um, crypto adoption um, across, you know, the, the whole industry. So, yeah, very um, happy with the uh, partnerships that we had so far and obviously the fact that we can bring all these travel products uh, to the platform to offer to, to our consumers um, through the Travel.com platform. Same applies to blockchain partners. Um, you know, we partner with some of the leading brands in, in this space. Again, Tron is another one of them, not included in this presentation, but um, one that we've been working very close uh, with, sin, uh, with since, since the beginning. Um, we believe that building this strong ecosystem around the Travel.com platform uh, will benefit not just the, the platform itself, but the whole the whole ecosystem by allowing communities from different projects um, to be able to you know book travel through travel.com platform and also for our existing users and our existing community to get to know these projects for example as we uh, integrate them on the travel.com platform so yeah in a nutshell very excited about what's to come in 2021 and looking forward um, beyond uh, 2021 and um, yeah I'll just uh, would like to recommend anyone to please um, check us out go and take a look at travel.com whenever you want to book a, a hotel or a flight or anything um, uh, help us uh, you know bring <laughs> adoption to the industry yeah and by the way you'll save some money as well because we also offered you know a best price guarantee so if any user finds a better deal anywhere else we will match it or beat it Thank you very much, Juan, for sharing. I hope uh, this uh, COVID-19 will, you know, just leave us uh, as uh, fast as possible, right? So that the people can really participate into the real use case in blockchain. I mean, this is a very exciting use case, right? Thank you again, yeah. Juan, yeah, for sharing. No worries. Yeah, uh, looking for the more yeah. more travels <laughs> globally yes, later on. Yeah. yeah, 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 okay. I think we... I think we all each into travel again. So yeah, yeah I think we yeah, are just coming to the part. end of the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, appreciate your time. So hope to see you soon. So bye. Thank you for your time. Bye. Same. Thanks for having me here. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. So for Juan sharing, we understand that the tourist tourism industry has not been closely integrated with crypto assets in many aspects, right? So I believe that the future is promising for the massive adoption of digital assets in the blockchain. So if an uh, industry is well developed, it usually will happen to have lots of applications in the, a variety of areas. For example, in the last two years, companies providing trust and custody services are in the spotlight of the market. So next, let's welcome Kevin to give his presentation on history and great changes in financial applications, big changes and the trails in the history of financial applications. Let's welcome Kevin. So hey, Kevin, this is Tracy. Hi, Tracy. Thank yeah. you for the introduction. So it's your time. <laughs> you can Fantastic. Start. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So as Tracy mentioned, my name is Kevin Litsinity. Um I've been in the crypto space for about five years now um, and I've been in fintech, you know, the, the rest of my career. 
I currently serve as the chief strategy officer for Prime Trust, which is a Nevada state chartered trust company. We're a financial institution here in the U.S. in the crypto space, like a uh, Paxos, BitGo, you know, some other trust companies here in the U.S. that are in the space. I'm also the um, co-founder at a startup called Bank, and I'm also the host of a new show um, that's airing January 8th called Building Blocks, which is all about fintech education, blockchain 101, um, things like that. And at Prime Trust, I should mention prior to becoming chief strategy officer, um, I've also been chief product officer. I've been chief technology officer. I've worn a lot of hats over the last five years, so I can speak a lot to you know, the history of being a custodian in the space, how the space has evolved from our perspective, um, things of that nature. What I'm asked, you know, probably most often is, uh, is kind of why have I decided to professionally dedicate myself to the crypto space, right? Why is that what Prime Trust does? Why is that what I do? And why does it really matter to the broader world? And I think this is an interesting question that's becoming more and more relevant um, every day as we get more media attention into the space and we get more adoption from a broader audience, that's really what people are looking at. And for me, it really boils down to kind of three different things. Um, I'm definitely a libertarian at heart. So the first thing for me is always self-sovereignty, right? Having the ability to actually control keys, to actually control assets and not be bringing them to other places where you know you no longer have the final say in what they do you're able to actually own that asset. You're able to control it. No one can tell you how you can spend it. Um, That matters a lot, a lot to me as a libertarian. But then the other, um, which I think is more interesting to the broader audience, is that crypto kind of allows for access to a whole different set of financial products, right? We can start to have fractionalized assets, whether they be fiat currencies through stable coins, whether they be, you know, securities that are traded on the New York Stock Exchange, for example, Right, crypto as an asset class has a really interesting possibility with the level of precision that exists. And you can really start to wrap assets, you can start to fractionalize that ownership. And maybe now I don't have to buy a full share of Berkshire Hathaway for a ton of money. I can buy, you know, 0.001 shares or things like that. I think when you look at stocks and you look at real estate and you look at larger investment projects, that's a really interesting thing of, of why crypto matters. Um, you can also get into some really interesting things like asset-backed lending, right? Traditionally, for financial institutions and for other folks, asset-backed lending is, is really hard to do on the fly because you need to kind of value the assets that you're backing. And if it's not a public security, there's not really a liquidity option for these asset-backed loans. But now all of a sudden, through crypto, we basically see this brand new kind of industry it's around you know the liquidity pools and around DeFi and basically being able to say hey i'm going to lock up some bitcoin i'm going to take a loan against that collateral that i'm putting up and i'm going to go then spend you know these funds that i got as a loan and meanwhile the asset that's collateralizing it is rising right all of that happens because you have these 24 7 markets um and then lastly you know things like staking just didn't exist before blockchain so you know i know that's kind of a long-winded answer um, but I think it's important to kind of set the stage. And I know no one really wants to listen to me talk about new financial products. You want to hear about prime trust and other things, which I'll get to. Um, but I think it's important for people to understand why we do the things that we do um, and why this industry exists and why, you know, I and, and the folks here at prime trust and at bank and at, at building blocks, we're all really passionate about the space. Um, you know, finally, it's kind of the globalized asset classes. There's very little assets that you can actually use to move value globally, let alone 24 seven, let alone almost instantaneously. Um, So to me, that's why crypto matters. Um, And let me talk a little bit about the ecosystem um, that we've built and and how you can build in in blockchain, because I know that's something that's often um, misunderstood or, or difficult to understand. Really what we did is we started by building Prime Trust, right? And I'll kind of go into the, the broader strategy. Um, but for those of you that are unfamiliar with Prime Trust, Prime Trust flagship product is something called Prime Core. And we really view Prime Core as financial infrastructure. Uh, we like to say that we're the AWS, but for FinTech apps. And the reason we say that is because just like you don't really, you know, host a, a server in the closet at the office anymore, you, you deposit, you deploy things, um, now to the cloud, whether it's AWS or Google Cloud or or something else, we want to do the same and we are doing the same um, for the fintech space. 
So Prime Core is basically an API or a set of infrastructure, and it covers seven different pieces. It covers custody, whether it's fiat or digital assets. Um, it covers payment rails, cards, wires, you know, APIs for all sorts of payment processing. It covers liquidity, the buying of selling of Bitcoin, buying and selling of other crypto, buying and selling of fractional shares. Um, it covers debit card issuance that you can go and spend that crypto on a debit card wherever MasterCard's accepted. It covers indemnity because fraud and chargeback risk are huge when you're processing retail rails, right? So you wanna be able to process credit cards with indemnification against chargebacks um, down the road. We have a 24 seven kind of settlement engine for USD and crypto option in the dark pool. Um, and then of course, this is all wrapped around our compliance program and our US regulatory license. Um, and this really is intended for anybody building fintech applications. And as we looked at the role of a custodian, I think what led us to build this and what we realized kind of early on is that being a custodian in and of itself isn't actually that interesting, right? What's kind of the end goal? And the end goal is to foster the adoption of, of crypto and blockchain. And how can we best do that as a custodian? Is it by holding on to some Bitcoin or TRX or, or whatever the asset is? Um, and the answer is no, actually holding on to crypto isn't a very interesting problem. It's what is everything else that we can enable with kind of our regulatory positioning and what technology can we deploy out into the market? That's what people are really interested in. And I think once we started to think of a custodian as a technology infrastructure, now all of a sudden kind of our, our entire process changed, right? And, and prime core is now the infrastructure that powers Binance US, Bittrex, um, OKCoin, stable coins like TrueUSD, um, crypto on ramps like Swan, right? This infrastructure is used by a ton of different projects and companies from small startups in the garage to enterprises like Binance. Um, and that to me is a lot more interesting, right? When you can take these seven pieces, you can build almost anything that you want on top of these seven pieces. If you're building an exchange, you can use the payment rails, you could use the liquidity, you can use the custody and you can use the settlement. And now what you have is an exchange that you can deploy to the market really quickly, right? Taking that role of a custodian and actually basically giving more fundamental tools and infrastructure. That's, that's what we've been trying to do with Prime Trust. And we think that's what is really important going into the next 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, the role of a custodian isn't actually to really be a custodian anymore, right? It's to give these Lego pieces, it's to give these plug and play different capabilities and different functionality that lets people get products to market quickly, that lets people innovate, and that basically enables this other generation of FinTech applications to be built on top of us. That's kind of our, our enterprise play. Um, and then of course, we're not happy with just one thing, right? We're trying to really push the industry forward in a lot of ways. So what we say is if you're trying to build a FinTech application, whether it be an exchange or anything else, um, you should build on top of Prime Core, right? You should talk to Prime Trust, you should come talk to us and we can provide you with a lot of technology, a lot of kind of regulatory positioning um, and a lot of services that can help you get to market quickly. Um, but now what if you're a consumer that doesn't really help a consumer or what if you're a fintech application that's looking for a user base, right? So take, for example, something like crypto payments. Crypto payments is traditionally, you know, kind of something that's difficult to do in the US, you know, BitPay obviously services the space. Um, and that's kind of it. So if you're an application and you're trying to get basically your users to be able to pay via crypto, or you're trying to interact with end users, you have some issues. And that's where we're trying to come at the market from two different places. And that's actually where we introduced um, a concept called Bank. And Bank is a, uh, it's a mobile application. It's the beta is live in, in the app stores and, and the Google Play stores. But the view for Bank is to be the consumer application, right? So Bank is going to allow in future iterations for people to hold digital currencies in their wallets. You can deposit Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tron-based assets. Um, you know, whatever crypto assets you want to hold. And then we're going to make it really easy for people to get in and out of those assets. So we can bring a whole nother wave of people into the crypto space. And we're also going to make it really easy for people to then spend that crypto um, basically at any merchant that they want, right? That 
that to me is an interesting combination. You have Prime Trust as a custodian creating infrastructure for other applications to build on top of. And then you have Bank as a consumer application serving as an on-ramp and serving as an entry point into crypto. And that means that now basically our goal is for people to stop, people in the space to stop fighting each other for market share, right? When an exchange pops up right now, at least my perception, is that a lot of it is trying to basically pull users from the other exchange, right? It's exchange competing against exchange for kind of a set user base. And it's a lot less about, you know, bringing new people who aren't yet in crypto into crypto. Um, and that's a much harder problem to solve. But we fundamentally believe that by being able to service kind of the enterprise space and to enable more interesting applications to be built, while at the same time, creating kind of a retail and a consumer experience to increase the total size of the space that we're able to tackle this problem from both sides. Um, and then, you know, when you look at DeFi projects and things like that, they all need a user base, right? They're all intimidating. A lot of people who are new to crypto aren't um, you know, sophisticated enough to really get into DeFi projects. Those are all things that we can leverage bank to try to tackle and try to get people into. Um, and then kind of lastly, the third important piece for us is education, right? We're big believers in increasing the size of the crypto industry, getting new users into crypto, getting people to buy their first blockchain-based assets, getting people to really engage and understand in what is, what is crypto? What is blockchain? What are we all doing here? Everybody that's talking today and everybody that's kind of listening here is listening because they're interested in crypto. So how do we get them into the space? How do we increase that? And for us, that's all about education. And that's why we've recently decided that we're going to start a show. I don't want to call it a podcast because there's a video component, but we're going to start a show called Building Blocks. And Building Blocks is streaming on YouTube and lots of other fun places. And that's all about blockchain education. And it's all about getting more consumers into the space. So when we think about at a high level, you know, how do you build, how do you build the future, right? How do you take the blockchain industry from where it is today to something that's completely mainstream and that's used everywhere that's ubiquitous, right? Think of the internet in the 90s versus the internet now. How do you take the blockchain platforms and that technology and you make that giant leap? For us, we're trying to hit it from every angle. We're trying to support it from the enterprise side with Prime Trust, Prime Core, taking the custodian, making it a complete infrastructure platform to get new projects out quickly, get them to market kind of in a you know, compliant manner, in a safe manner. Um, we're trying to increase the consumer user base by leveraging bank, by creating kind of that easy on-off ramp, that way to get into the industry. And then we're going to try to hit it from an educational angle as well and try to educate people on what is crypto, what are these new assets that you can get, why is self-sovereignty important, and why is all the work that we're doing here important? And I think in a nutshell, um, that's kind of an introduction to what we're doing here more broadly at, um, at Prime. And if any of those things are obviously interesting to anybody out there, um, mm -hmm. you know, we'd be happy to, to hear from you. We're always excited to support new infrastructure from Prime Trust and have more apps and things built on top of us. Um, and then we're also excited to be able to bring a user base to more people, right, by integrating paying with bank and things like that. Um, I think in a nutshell, I know that's a long-winded answer to kind of what is the what does a custodian look like in the future? I think mm -hmm. the short answer is it doesn't actually look like a custodian at all. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like a technology services provider. Mm -hmm. um, but that's hopefully as, as much of an introduction as I can fit in, in 10 or 15 minutes and mm -hmm. a little bit of a, a preview into what we're building here and uh, how we think that impacts the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Kevin, for sharing here. Okay. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I hope to see you soon. And uh, take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. So uh, now we know the significant role of asset managed companies in the market. So let's hope that the major changes in the financial application will surprise the market. So as a biggest gateway to uh, to blockchain, its change have always been the uh, paramount importance. And in the face of the new situation, so we must not overlook the challenges 
confronted by its changes. So it's crucial to figure out how to get out of the comfort zone and deal with the changes and the barriers in the industry. So we are pleased to have Sam to give us a speech on how should its change take on the new challenges. So how will its changes overcome three major obstacles, like a high access barrier, great difficulties, and high cost. So hi, Sam. Great to have you here. It's the Tracy Hi. from Cointelegraph, China. See you again. Hey, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thanks for having you. Yeah. Um, so it's your time sorry. now. I'll give it to you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and just during the PowerPoint, sorry, give me one second. Um, um, So we are waiting for your keynote, right? Yep, yep. Sorry, just just uh, sharing screen here. Mm -hmm. This is sure. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Is that is that working? Can you see the slideshow now? Ah, uh, didn't this see yet? Maybe you no. can try again. I I will just give up on this in one sec. This doesn't work. Ah, 那边要放了呀！你们这边看到了吗？信号。Um. No, see your slides. Uh. There we go. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, I'm just gonna start talking soon. But um, all right, so okay, great, it works now. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Nice, mm -hmm. cool. So, I, uh, you know, thinking about where, you know, where the uh, cryptocurrency is headed and uh, industry is headed, and like you know, very specifically, you know, where exchanges are headed, and 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 what are sort of gonna be, you know, the pathways forward. Um, Exchanges sort of serve a really interesting uh, role in the cryptocurrency industry, and and they serve a really big one. And I think this is really central to where they are now and where they're going. If you look at what an exchange means in traditional finance, um, you know, typically it refers pretty specifically to you know a match engine, uh, to uh, a place where. Um, you know, a buyer and a seller can meet to do a trade. And so, you know, two users might ultimately trade on the New York Stock Exchange um, in some stock, but every other part of that process is sort of governed by different things. And so, you know, people would be using a broker like, you know, Schwab or, 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 or Fidelity, you know, some front end to connect to it. They'd be using, you know, different lines ultimately to uh, access the actual matching engine, they may be going through a bunch of intermediaries in the middle, um, whether it's through um, some aggregation, whether it's through some dark pool, whether it's through, uh, you know, some HFT firm. Um, and, I, you know, the trade might be passed off a few times before actually, you know, getting ultimately printed between two parties on the order book. Um, and, you know, they're sort of totally different entities which are designing these products, which are listing them, creating them, marketing them, you know, the customer acquisition is generally not a thing that exchanges are focused or are sure, the primary drivers of. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's just a lot of different companies which are serving a lot of different pieces in that story. Um, but when you take a look at, at sort of the, uh, uh, the cryptocurrency industry, exchanges are, are many of those at once. Like the exchange isn't just a matching engine. It's also the risk and liquidation engine. It's the customer acquisition engine. It's the listing decisions. It's in many cases, the product design and development and creation. Um, it's the front end, it's the API. They're just like aren't middlemen. Um, and instead, you know, many exchanges actually just serve 
like every role at once involved in sort of the pipeline of a trade coming to fruition. I think that's super interesting. Um, and it's one of the reasons that exchanges have been such a big part of the cryptocurrency space, you know, basically from the beginning, where if you ask people and say, you know, name the, you know, 10 biggest things you can in crypto, probably like a third of them are going to be exchanges. Whereas if you, if you said like ask people, you, you know, to name the 10 biggest things in finance, you know, I don't know, maybe one of them will be an exchange. Um, so what that means is that instead of having, uh, it, it's interesting because, you know, it, it's almost a point of, of centralization compared to traditional finance. It's, it's almost like more is concentrated um, into a few venues. And I, uh, that that certainly shaped what exchanges do today and what the cryptocurrency industry looks like today. I mean, customer loyalty is often you know as much exchange based as it as it is product or ticker based or token based. Um, and and when you look at regulation, regulation is often focused on exchanges as much as everything else, um, uh, which again is is really in contrast to uh, to traditional finance. Um, and, and so you have sort of this one point which ends up bearing the brunt of, you know, half the customer acquisition and half the regulatory pressure and half the product development, really, of the entire space. Um, and that that's sort of, you know, been really, really central to how crypto you know, has developed so far, and, and I guess that it will continue at least for the kind of like near future to be central to, to how it responds to external pressures. And so as you start to see consolidation in the exchange space, and we've definitely seen this, like we've definitely seen some exchanges dropping off, we've seen some revitalized and some growing. Um, and you know, I can say, obviously, I've been, you know, really excited by the growth that we've seen um, in FTX over the last year. Um, but, uh, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's not the only venue that that's had, had a good year, um, that looking forward, um, a lot of the focus on the development of the crypto industry is resting on the development of exchanges. When you think about, you know, what crypto is going to look like in the United States, which is just one of the biggest markets, obviously in the world you know, the thing that people focus on there as much as anything else is how are exchanges going to interface with regulators, right? Like what products are exchanges going to be able to offer in, in, in sort of, you know, in the jurisdiction to its residents. Um, and, uh, you know, when people think about offering derivatives in the United States, a lot of that focus is on negotiations between exchanges and regulators. Um, and so, you know, exchanges end up as ambassadors as well for the industry in, in a bunch of different places. And that can be good and that can be bad. And, you know, the, the bad side of this is is when there's disputes between exchanges and regulators, when, when things don't go well, it can taint the entire industry and how people view it. Um, and, and and on the flip side, it, it, can, it also can mean that, like, ideally not every single token, every single product has to separately figure out how to fit within regulatory frameworks and and how to interface with regulators. Um, if exchanges can take the lead on that, um, then they can do that on behalf of all of their listings. And so I think, you know, as we look forward to, to, to 2021, one of the big things that I'm going to be looking for is what do relationships between exchanges and regulators look like, particularly in the United States, um, in China, in Japan, and, and in Korea, and a few other venues where um, there's you know huge potential for the industry. Um, and I think that that will end up just having large impacts on how the industry overall develops. So. Um, so that, that, that's, I think, one of the key things that, that, that I'm looking for. And, you know, I'm optimistic that those will go well. I'm optimistic that there's going to be good developments and that 
um, you know, basically exchanges and regulators are going to come to a good place um, in terms of how to deal with each other. But that's not guaranteed. And, and I think that that's going to be one of the big things to look at. Um, and, you know, when you start to look at growth of the industry, um, I think you see possibly a similar thing where so much of the growth so far has been driven by a few products and a few exchanges. And uh, and that's how customer acquisition has worked. And and for other products, it's gone through exchanges. Um, and, you know, often the food chain there is Bitcoin attracts users to crypto that then in turn get attracted to, um, you know, in turn get attracted to one of a few different exchanges and then to other products on those exchanges. And that funnel has been huge. And, and it, it might continue, but I also expect to see other venues and an increasing diversity of those. And I think particularly, um, you know, as more mainstream institutions start to kind of dip their toes into the water here and start to, to look into getting into crypto, um, we've obviously seen that having huge impact on, on Bitcoin particularly. And I think that we're going to start to see that in other coins as well. And we're going to start to see those being entry points, right? And so if like PayPal isn't really an exchange right now, maybe that'll change. Um, but it is obviously a huge potential entry point for users into the space and for user acquisition and, and growth. Um, and, and, and we may, you know, same with GBTC. And, and we may see more of this. And I, I think that's going to lead to... Um, more white labeling. I think it's going to lead to more growth of the industry. I think it's going to lead to a more diverse set of ac customer acquisition tools um, with less of that falling on exchanges uh, in, in percentage terms um, than sort of historically has. Um, and, and I think that that means that there's going to be less, fo you know, more focus on the product and less on the branding of exchanges um, at least as far as public facing things are concerned on the margin. Although, you know, if we do see growth of the industry, I think that's going to be growth of all of these things. And so on an absolute scale, you might see growth in, in, in just every metric there. Um, and so I think that's sort of another trend, which I don't know, but, I, but if I had to guess, I would guess we'll see something like that. Um, and then I, you know, I think finally, as we look forward to, to 2021, I think that there's going to be a lot of eyes on, and a lot of eyes on Bitcoin and Bitcoin performance and just purely that. Um, but there's also going to be a lot of eyes on what is crypto, on people trying to figure out what this thing is, how to, how to reckon with it, how to think about it. And, you know, I think in, in a lot of people's minds, it's still to be determined whether crypto is basically, um, you know, a thing you can gamble on and buy and sell, whether it's a payment rail, whether it's meant to be some decentralized ecosystem, whether it's um, a way to store your wealth in sort of a private manner, um, whether it's some large decentralized computation engine, um, whether it's a way to easily uh, create fractional bits of things, or, or something else altogether, or all of those. And of course, part of the answer is that it is all of those. And that, that there are a lot of sides to crypto and a lot of things it can mean. But, uh, but, you know, also part of the answer is that the world is still trying to figure out exactly what long term um, it's going to think of crypto as. And especially people who have like, you know, sort of been on the outskirts for a lot of the time and, 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 you know, have been paying some attention, but not, I uh, not really tuned in, but I, you know, might be doing so over the next year. Um, as, as again, we start to see bits of sort of the broader world dip their toes into cryptocurrency. And I, I think it's going to be really important what narrative develops there, how that ends up, how people end up seeing crypto, um, and how regulators do, but also just how the public does, how institutions do. 
Um, and I think you're going to see really different, you know, methods of adoption and patterns of adoption, depending on that. And I just don't know what the answer is. Um, and I, I think that a lot of that might be super dependent on a few things. Um, you know, really just looking at like in the end, um, what do I, you know, what do people end up, uh, what, what memes end up propagating, right? Like what do people end up talking to each other about? What do, what do people say? What do people think when they think of Bitcoin, when they think of crypto? And, um, and, and I think that that's going to play a pretty big role in just what patterns in general um, a job adoption sort of shows. Um, and, and so anyway, you know, whatever, there's, there's going to be a lot of things that will happen over the next year. No one knows for sure what's going to be dominant, what's going to matter. Um, but, it, but if I had to sort of guess right now at which patterns um, and, and sort of which, which lines are going to end up having a really big lasting impact on the industry, I think those are some things that I would point to. And I think those are things which, which are going to matter quite a bit um, and where we don't know the answer yet. You know, we don't know what is, the world's going to decide, um, but what it does decide could uh, shape, shape the industry for, for decades to come. Um, all of that being said, you know, I mean, no one was even paying attention to crypto, you know, eight years ago, really. And certainly very few people, you know, saw crypto for what it was eight years ago and then nailed what it was going to be today and and what it looked like it might be tomorrow. This industry changes at such a rapid pace compared to most. It innovates so quickly. It builds new things so quickly. Um, and it builds new narratives so quickly that it's just really hard to, in any sort of reasonable generalized sense, um, you know, really answer the question of like, uh, what will happen in the industry? I think I think no one knows is, is just the right answer. And anyone who has an answer that's confident and not that is sort of full of shit. Um, and, and, and that's just the overarching theme here is, uh, you know, what happens tomorrow depends on what we do today. And I, yeah. uh, you know, if we can't know that ahead of time. Yeah, I mean, at least uh, we we t together tonight uh, we witnessed the Bitcoin reach to the all time high, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. yeah, it's a good sign. I mean, a new milestone. Let's see. Yep. You know, it's hard to tell what's going on, you know, in the future. Even I think from your perspective, I mean, you understand the trading, you understand DeFi well. I mean, you post a lot of good projects, but still, it's hard to predict, right? So just rapidly yeah. changing a lot. So let's just uh, stay positive. I mean, right? So, so it really depends totally. on what we are doing right now. So it's delivery the result for tomorrow, right? So, yep. We should uh, line up. <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah thank you Sam, very much for your speech and uh, this uh, really inspiring yeah i mean um exchanges are an essential component of the blockchain industry i mean having listened to your presentation we are now more optimistic that uh, exchange will bring industry a promising future in the crypto world thanks again sam thanks for having me yeah and I mean, thanks for staying with us for this late. <laughs> I see, <laughs> I see you a little bit tiring. Okay, bye, um, Sam. Hope see you soon. Okay, thanks. So next speech is about uh, Polonix, which is an exchange that has a closest tie with Tron. So Polonix is a leading global digital asset trading platform that was founded back to 2014. Since Tron and Polonix established a strategic partnership, they have been jointly working on the stablecoin Tron TRC20 USDT and decentralized finance in Tron specialty trading zone and many other potential businesses. So Tron also offers expert tips today to help Polonix enter the Asia, Pacific, and the Chinese markets illegally. So next, Zri will share more about the Polonix. Let's welcome Zri. Hello, Zri. It's your time now. Hey. <laughs> Hello again. Can you see the slides? Oh, uh, not yet. 
So you can try again. Mm. Um, um, it says I'm sharing. Yeah, it works now. Sharing. Yeah, it works now. Thank you very much. Perfect. Okay, Thank you. you. Hi, everyone. It's good to be back. Um, my name is Zuri. I'm the head of business development at uh, Poloniex, one of the oldest uh, ex uh, cryptocurrency exchanges in the industry. Um, so today we are going to talk about Poloniex has a weekend to make wonders and uh, the initial progress that we have made in the last year and uh, what we are going planning to do in the near future uh, on track to open a new chapter um, in 2021 and uh, uh, beyond. So as most OGs and the people who have traded cryptocurrency in the last 10 years, they would know that Poloniex is one of the longest standing cryptocurrency trading platforms in the world, and uh, we have consistently been among the top exchanges uh, since we started in early 2014. So by January 2021, it will be seven years old for um, Polo. And we have served um, many, many customers from all corners of the world. So um, for people who, that who didn't know, in November 2019, a little over a year ago, Polo went through a spin-off from Circle. Um, so what has been going on after the spin-off of uh, a year ago? So let's take a quick look at uh, the accomplishment we have done in uh, from the time of the spin-off. So Polo has, uh, we are driven to offer customers best-in-class features and services that includes access to the newest listing and IEOs on our platform, Futures trading, uh, we launched eight in 2020. Spot, spots and margin trading on um, over 270 markets now. And ways to earn interest and ways to lend and earn on our platform. Competitive trading fees across the industry and easier onboarding for customers and localization, meaning we offer uh, many different kinds of languages for customers. We have VIP programs for traders and high priority supports for uh, market makers um, uh, and f uh, regular uh, competitions that we offer. Right now we have the Tron Futures uh, competition that's going on and uh, we uh, just come to trade and to share the $25,000 worth of USDT. So that's the things we have been offering since uh, the spinoff. So, um, if you look at the graph on the right, you'll see the trading volume um, as well as new users have grown three times uh, since uh, 2019 uh, with the circle days. So uh, not only do we onboard a lot more users, but the trading volume has gone up tremendously uh, compared with a year ago. Um, and uh, another program that's worth noting is that we uh, started the referral program where it's 20% for um, you and 10% for the invitees that come and trade on Poloniex. And there's no KYC required for level one users uh, where you only need a username and email to come trade. So it's super easy and uh, seamless onboarding uh, experience. And this is just one of the many features we offered to our users. And um, Th this number is very surprising and shocking because in 2019, Poloniex only listed three assets. And uh, so far, the year hasn't finished, but we have already listed over 125 different kind of assets across stablecoin, DeFi assets, leveraged tokens, and um, uh, public blockchain projects um, in the last 12 months. So it's 20 times more than uh, what happened in 2019 uh, so far. So that's a great achievement we've seen with a very small and agile team that we have at uh, Polo. We don't have a big team like many other exchanges. Um, we have uh, less than 100 people. So very proud for the achievement we've done so far. And uh, uh, last week, we actually released a new UI, um, UX for our users. Um, so as you can see, um, our um, trading experience has improved for both website and mobile users. It's more seamless. It's easier to use a dark mode and light mode. Uh, so uh, we are driven to uh, listen to users what they want, what the demands are, and we would deliver 
the features uh, that they need and uh, more seamless trading experience. And then there's also easier way to check um, your balances on the exchange and more ways to earn with soft staking and later your farming opportunities on the exchange. And here's the, the screenshot of our website and uh, mobile, mobile app. So the other notable accomplishment we have done in 2020 is we launched Launchbase on Poloniex in 20 uh, this year. And uh, so we are looking for more projects to come launch uh, on Polo for um, the uh, on the launch base. So if your project is interested, please feel free to reach out to our team. So just the example of Just Token. Um, so 24 hours after the initial sale, we saw over 7.5 million trading volume and uh, the price went up 27x uh, compared with the initial price. And uh, it, it sold out um, less in less than five minutes. Um, and the price is still holding up strong many months after the initial launch. So it's a great feature we uh, we launched and we're planning to do more on the launch base in 2021. So next, we uh, listen to our community's feedback. They want to uh, trade uh, uh, contracts and futures. So we have already listed eight perpetual swap contracts so far. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the Tron futures trading campaign is going on right now. And uh, users can come and participate and win 25,000 USDT. Uh, so come and check it out on Polo. So uh, last but not least is that we have created a strong alliance with the Tron ecosystem. And uh, we are dedicated to support the Tron ecosystem uh, going forward. So just to give you a couple of examples, in 2020, we have successfully integrated Wink. Uh, so users can custody their funds on Polo wallets while they use the Wink platform. And uh, if you use TRX to trade, you can save 25% of the trading fees. Um, and then, um, of course, you can use TRX on our launch base, as I just mentioned. And we also have the Polony DEX exchange, not only the centralized exchange, but also the decentralized component of it. And uh, we offer the best rates for TRX, BTT, and WIN staking on Poloniex. Um, and there's just more integrations and more benefits uh, that are coming um, in uh, the next year. So uh, stay tuned for that. So as you can see, we have been working hard and shaping hard. And um, mm, so that's, that's the past year. And now we have a lot more uh, exciting news to share with you in the coming year in 2021. Um, so what you can look forward to um, as a user, um, so as is that we are working hard to improve the user experience for both mobile websites. There are more listings and more futures contracts uh, um, um, launching, and there will be one in early January. And then there's uh, more earnings opportunity coming, like your farming, uh, improved API, improved KYC, improved website and app, more and more fiat on ramps, more currencies that you can use. We're launching a new loyalty program early next year and improved institutional onboarding. And uh, we're onboarding more market makers to improve liquidity trading. And there's just, uh, just to name a few, there's just way more to come in our product map. Uh, we're really excited. So as we can see today, the bull market is here. The bull market has started um, earlier this year, uh, I would say summer 2020, and it's, it's, it's going strong. So uh, we mm -hmm. are really excited to to sh to uh, go on the journey with our users, and uh, we we look forward to you to join us on on the journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zuri. Thanks. Appreciate your time. So Polynex so has yeah always been committed to providing top notch features and services to customers. So it has been exactly. actively yeah looking for quality assets to join. It's platform with its uh, alliance like Tron. Polonix will definitely continue to make efforts to further grow and the Tron ecosystem. Thank you very much again, Siri, for sharing. Thank you. Here. Yeah, bye. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Yeah, take care. And just now we listen to the speech from the exchange that has a closest tie with Tron. Now it's time for Tronlink, the wallet that has a closest um, 
tie with Tron again. So as a largest decentralized wallet in Tron ecosystem, and the only wallet that supports both web and the mobile clients, so Tronlink has served over 400,000 Tron users. It's a uh, inter uh, entry level multifunctional wallet on Tron. So next, please welcome Adam Liu to give us a presentation. So development of next generation blockchain infrastructure. What direction will digital asset storage provide uh, take in a new year? So let's welcome Adam. Hey hello, Adam, yeah. yeah, it's Tracy here. So it's your time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone. It is so happy to join this meeting to share Chang Link's programs this year with you. Okay. So here, as the biggest wallet on Chang, I'm going to share some information with you. Basically, around these three points, what Chang is now, then what we have done this year, then what we will do in the future work. Mm -hmm. First is the work, some data and some information now about Chainlink. Mm. Uh, currently in 2020, Chainlink has reached a max monthly users over 1 million and also reached a max daily users to 700,000 with the average daily user chance to more than 10 minutes. So also Chainlink has a very good user retention we have a one day retentions over 40% and seven day, seven day retentions over 20%. Monthly daily user retentions around 10%. So that's a very good score. So we are quite proud of our users. As for user distribution, Chinese currently is a very global world is all over the world as we can see the map. Um, we have the already a lot of many users in Europe, in India, Africa, China, South Korea, and uh, even America. So that's quite, a lot, quite popular in different countries. This also shows that China is already accepted by a lot of people in the world across nations. Um, next, I'm going to show some data around access distribution. Thanks to, to our users' confidence, Chinese cars manage more than 56% of the assets on China. This also makes we recognize that the security and user education are so important and so immersing for this industry. We can get reports of assets loss from time to time, some for hacker attacks and some for users' care business. So uh, I think um, compared with the modern bank systems, we still have a long way to go. Um, the following part, I'm going to share what we have done this year to improve our training product. Uh, being recognized the importance of the APP, we rebuilt our dev modules in early this year to make it more easier to find use and more, even more easier for developers to sub submit more devs. So this work improve our users' daily time trade on training. Also make training better to support this year's divide market heart. So DeFi, DeFi support, this is what we have done for uh, DeFi supporting. Um, training support almost all the hottest De uh, DeFi, hot, hot DeFi apps, such as Trump, Sam, Just, Just Swap. And we also noticed that the DX Swap is so important uh, that we also ending native support for token swap. So this is going to be released soon. And just Ramper is also another big dev we support this year. With this support, training users can take advantage of general knowledge proofs of on chain decentralized shared network. And it's the instant transfer is very fast. And with all the information regarding on chain operation hidden, attacks can now match the on chain information with specific individuals and also very easy to use. Also, in order to have a better user experience, we improve our what is weak network statements, UX and UI. This work also um, improve with the server size work. With more servers, better logic organizations and data support while keeping improve our product. So for server size 
technology details. We change our version one server size to version two uh, with uh, multi modules. This will bring a more flexible and better server's responsible speed. Also, we are doing more work on a faster on chain even module. This will bring more fancy features in the future and in the next year. Still, still the work for our server size. For security reasons, um, we know that an um, influence has a big accident, server down accidents this year, which brings a lot of troubles to a lot of ETH or these teams. Charlie always insists on using and building out internal block node, which can bring um, a lot of benefits and avoid outside accidents. So we keep in trust of our users increment and all these events can bring great benefit to our training users. <clears throat> the last part I'm going to talk about our training spiritual work. <clears throat> Currently training has a 4.1 start on Google Play and 4.5 stars on Apple Store. As we can see, I think there are still some space to improve. Them. Uh, training uh, caring about users' feedback and take users' feedback as a very important information for future plan. For Apple, for app stability, uh, training iOS can reach a very good score, but uh, Android still has some work. I think for Apple Watches, this is a very important part we can keep trying. The next part and the last part, I think, is all this security. As the market is keeping hot and the outside threat is also keeping increased, so there are so many kind of attacks to users assessed. All these products as the user's most important tools should keep improved on security, including all the states, release and design and all these states. So bring more information to users to avoid no necessary loss is very important for what product. This also part of our training's feature mission to bring more future, more security and easy usage to users in our cyber work. Uh, that's all for my sharing today. Thanks everyone's listening and thanks for coming. Hey, thank you very much, Adam, for, for your speech. It's really inspiring, and we wish Tronlink Wallet a thriving future. Uh, we always seem to have something to talk about wallets, right? So when we make digital asset investment, we can't just rely on exchange to store our assets. So we need our own digital wallets to store our personal digital assets. However, as more and more weaknesses of centralized trading and survey emerge, users begin to shift their focus onto decentralized storage. So how should the wallets further grow in this context? Uh, founders and CMO of Token Pocket, um, Marcus, COO of Bitwell, Sun, and also CEO of Guanda Wallet, Paul, will answer this question in the panel discussion, how are digital asset storage services delivered? So welcome, guys. So hello, Marcus. Hello, uh, Sam. Hello, Paul. Great to have you all here on this panel discussion. Uh, I'm Tracy. Hey, thanks. Great to have you all here. Yeah. Hey, Tracy. Hey, thanks guys. for having us. Hey, nice hey. to meet you guys. <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, great. So I'll go very straightforward to our first question. So recent years have uh, witnessed all kinds of innovation and experimentation with wallets. So how can we build the core value of wallets based on user needs? I start from Marcus. So okay. So as we all know, that wallet is the portal to blockchain world, and is these functions are access, storage, transfers, and management. And users' needs are based on these basic requirements. And to build a core value, we need to find out what we can do around the access mm -hmm. and provide the features to the users as well as make it as easy as possible to use. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do it in many ways, uh, like 
what we have already done on token pocket to make transfer easier. We mm -hmm. built the gas stations for Trump users mm -hmm. to play the Trump DeFi uh, easier. We integrated just swap into token park uh, natively, and we recommend the hottest Trump device to Trump users mm -hmm. at a Trump depth sections, and also to cash in and cash out easier. We integrate USDT and Trump via gateway for users, mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So, Sun, if you can share your ideas here. Uh, yeah, I, I strongly believe that uh, currently the, the wallet are kind of a part of our daily life right mm -hmm. now. And from an exchange perspective, we really need to have a kind of a really good custodian solutions. Mm -hmm. And then from the user perspective, the current blockchain wallet are really more interesting compared to a few years back. Previously, mm -hmm. we only used for the blockchain wallet as a kind of a storage and then transfer nowadays we can see the wallet as a kind of a D apps staking DeFi and then wherever you need. And then I believe future in the coming soon with the blockchain wallet will be a part of our personal bank and then access management as well, even on the kind of our part of our identity. So these can be probably like really coming soon and then we'll uh, see more. Okay. okay. Right. Sounds interesting. Yeah. So Paul, if you have anything to add, on this question yeah i believe i believe that uh, this is a very good question because uh what really cost our customers need uh, i mean their core values is uh, quite simple they mm -hmm. like the decentralization that that's because most likely that's because they're in crypto they like they love the privacy and the uh, the thing that this, the the whole system is trustless mm -hmm. and what we try to do in border we always try to ask our customers uh, what actually do you want to have mm -hmm. and usually we take the polls and actually they influence our roadmap mm -hmm. and we're taking it also further uh, we right now are going to issue our token which will be uh, the form of the governance of our uh, features, mm -hmm. uh, feature roadmap. Uh, so uh, we believe that uh, this is, uh, we are, we, we can be compared to a bank, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, but but not the bank. So the, the, the best thing to describe us is the bank, but not the bank. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do, we want our customers to be able to decide actually which features do they want mm -hmm. and this is uh th this is what we always try to ask them and right now we're also issuing a token which uh they will receive simply for using the wallet mm -hmm. and what they will be able to do with this uh, token is actually to influence uh the uh the decisions we're making in 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 terms of uh the roadmap mm -hmm. so i believe this is this is the best way to go if we're talking about how can we implement the values that mm -hmm. our customers mm -hmm. have? Thank you very much. And my following question here is, uh, like we all know like uh, most of wallets in the market today are multi-platform or let's say multi-assets, right? And also support other functions such as the purchasing and the swapping assets um, in, inside the wallet. So how can we explore more use cases and further extend the functionality of wallets? So let's start from, uh, yeah, uh, let's start from uh, Marcus again. Yeah, from Token Pocket. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, to explore more use, use cases, we should find out what the users need to manage their assets. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to send, to earn, to play, or some other needs. Based on this, we can provide features that allow users to do the, the stuff they want, like a via gate to help them cash in and cash out, mm -hmm. a decentralized exchange, uh, AMM, like just, uh, just swap mm -hmm. to trade. Mm -hmm. uh, but not only uh, the common access, but also some uh, synthetic access. And to learn land and borrow a, uh, a land and borrow protocol, like just land, not only land and borrow, but also uh, can be a uh, collaterals to, uh, to make some uh, stable coins. 
and also a financial service help users to earn this data token easier and safer uh, mm -hmm. without understanding the complex uh, of blockchain and DeFi knowledge. Mm -hmm. We could sort the users into many kinds and learn from traditional industries and bring them to the on-chain and enrich the functionality and use case of the wallet and the blockchains. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. And the sun, uh, your take? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. That's a pretty interesting question, to be honest. Uh, actually, we are the same. Uh, there's a quite a lot of... Mm -hmm. I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't hear you clearly. Yes. Sun. So maybe your connection Bobby. not good? We more or less are our wallet address compared to last year. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we got a two times compared in the, this year, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, but the, the problem that we're seeing, like the wallet are still not very user friendly enough. Mm -hmm. And probably we need to improve on that part. So mm -hmm. that you know, we need to have a kind of a still have a little bit high entry barrier for a beginner. And so that they may not aware of that if we did, if they do not get the private key, they probably lost all their access. Mm -hmm. But I, I think uh, more on the other, other hand, then the other wallet are improving and they're very user friendly and easy to use and more and more real world application. And uh, a lot of industrial player coming in like Visa and the paper are really, really helpful to mm -hmm. this industry. Mm -hmm. And then uh, previously, if we are going to buy a, uh, coffee in the Starbucks with our wallet is kind of almost impossible because of mm -hmm. the blockchain uh, confirmation time. But now with uh, this kind of player coming in and then we are more closer to the our real world application basically, mm -hmm. which is really mm -hmm. cool. And just uh, kind of uh, this kind of mid player and a big player are kind of a uh, really healthy on our industry. And then that will be our further use case will be coming to our wallet applications basically and will mm -hmm. be helpful to the industry mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm. that's my take yeah. thank you thank you very much and the poll so your, your ideas on this uh, yeah i believe this is a very uh this is a very competitive field i mean creating mm -hmm. wallets and uh, there are lots of wallets on the market mm -hmm. but uh, we see that uh, most of the needs that customers actually have no one actually su succeeds in uh, delivering the, the features they want because receive and send, this is understandable. And this is not something that can bring you up in this uh, competition. Now, what we right now see is the emergence of DeFi. Mm -hmm. And when I say DeFi, I don't mean only the, uh, the borrow and uh, deposit thing. Mm -hmm. I mean all of the custody-free exchanges. I mean also the staking uh, and all these uh, various uh, uh, use cases that we mm -hmm. have right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I... I would say that I do not believe that we, won't, we will be able to pay with uh, uh, crypto in Starbucks in the near future because mm -hmm. I don't see any um, any demand on that. But if you go to, let's say, e-commerce, crypto would be perfect to, to use there. Mm -hmm. And if you are able to uh, link all the payments from your website to some kind of DeFi protocol where you, law, you, you get the loan uh, in accordance to, uh, to the funds you receive on a monthly basis, that would be nice. And this is a good use case. Mm -hmm. So supporting, uh, let's say, these DeFi uh, protocols and uh, DeFi in general mm -hmm. is uh, crucial for uh, for the wallets from our perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is our main focus for the moment. We really, really try to support all the DeFi uh, we see on the market. And for example, we support, definitely we support Tron staking, for example, and, yeah. and all this stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's also important for, for wallets to, uh, to, I mean, integrate lots of features uh, like in different uh, uh, very, very trending uh, factors. For example, like uh, NFT, we talk about the crypto, uh, crypto art, right? So 
uh, recently some wallet also integrated this crypto art concept into their wallet. So people, if I hold one NFT art, so I could see also through the wallet where I can check it, right? So how it looks like. I mean, this is a very interesting, uh, interesting thing for me. I don't know if you guys, uh, your wallets also have those kind of functions to follow the trend. I mean, especially for Paul, you have your Guada, right? Guada wallet. So you, su you support this kind of function, right? Yeah, we, we already support NFT. Uh -huh. And actually, we support some art as well. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, uh, this are Estonian local artists yeah. uh, who uh, paint for us uh, Bitcoin pictures. So I, I, I hope in some time uh, we will tokenize them and <laughs> try selling yeah. them as, a, yeah, yeah. as an NFT. Uh, but actually, uh, not only NFT is great, we, we support NFT already and you can, for example, see your CryptoKitty uh, uh -huh. or yeah, uh, yeah. There, are, there, there are, I think, five NFTs that are supported mm -hmm. in our wallet. And if you have a CryptoKitty, you can see it in the interface, actually, if you have it on the address uh, that yeah. you use in Guardian Wallet. Uh, but I believe that NFT is, uh, is one of the uh, major... Uh, points where our industry can grow uh -huh. because this okay. is nice if you have uh, let's say you play uh, the game and you have some magic sword uh -huh. that, is, that makes you super awesome in the MMORPG that you play uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and it, it actually costs something uh, for you and for other players uh -huh. as well uh, and you can, for example, using DeFi, you can get a loan uh, putting this uh, magic sword into collateral. When I think about such use cases, I believe that there is a huge, uh, there is a huge new market that is opening right now, uh, which is uh, highly undervalued at the moment. Mm -hmm. So yes, we, we, we see the demand there. Uh, unfortunately, we're lacking uh, projects that are actually using uh, non-fungible tokens, mm -hmm. and we we look at uh, at this uh, market uh, niche. Uh, and as soon as uh, big projects appear, I think the same day we will start creating more and more features for that. And one of Great. the first will be. Uh, the DeFi for the NFT. I strongly <laughs> yeah. believe in that. Yeah, we go a little bit further, but uh, that, 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 that's also a uh, nice question, answer. Thank you very much. So uh, my next question is, uh, as we expect the blockchain technology to uh, go with every aspect of our lives in the future, so how can we upgrade the blockchain wallets? I mean, let's start uh, this time from San. Uh, you can share a little bit. Uh, uh, sure. So uh, my take is like, I, I really think the wallet will be really become a part of our daily life mm -hmm. and then part of our access holder mm -hmm. and then kind of a mini bank. And definitely the, the whole ecosystem need to be built up the, uh Definitely like policy currently the e-commerce probably the, the best use case. Mm -hmm. And definitely for the, those kind of thing like in order to e-commerce to improve that we need to build up the ecosystem like Amazon on eBay, they start accepting mm -hmm. a wallet and we can start seeing that Shopify or WooCommerce, they already have some plugin yeah. for the accepting of crypto crypto access. And then I might I have my own website and then I start implementing with that those kind of WooCommerce uh, accepting the crypto access as well. So this will be the current uh, next trend that we probably start seeing people start using the crypto access. Mm -hmm. Uh, other than that, uh, if I think in the future, it can be like NFT can be uh, out of our mortgage. And then if we finish the mortgage and we own a flat and it will be one of our NFT and it really go into our wallet and then we can show everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, even our medical and private information will be in our wallet. Mm -hmm. So it's a part of our identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think wallet will be going into the really part of our daily life mm -hmm. compared to our Mm -hmm. other part of our life okay thank you very much and uh, markers from a token part side token pocket sorry <laughs> okay so where do you see that mm. okay okay uh, so as a world provider uh the most important thing to is to keep the users keys safe and help them 
uh, sign transactions mm -hmm. and try to make it easier to use. Mm -hmm. So to upgrade it, we have many parts uh, that we can do. So on the user experience side, uh, the easier is the better. Mm -hmm. So make it almost the same as the traditional uh, internet product. Mm -hmm. uh, what the users understand, uh, the user can understand it when they are using it. They don't have to understand uh, which chain they're using and what kind of technology is behind. So mm -hmm. um, to make it easier is better. And on the server side, provide as many safe, uh, safe blockchain related products as possible. Learn about the user's uh, requirements and list the, all the depths and device as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And a quick response uh, customer service, uh, even integrate the AI customer service to answer all the questions because uh, we know that there are a lot of newbies coming to the uh, blockchain and they don't understand what blockchain is. Uh -huh. And they okay. should, uh, there, there should be a portal for them to, to uh, ask questions uh -huh. and they can learn from there. Yeah. And from the technology side, I think that we should follow up the community. community uh, what are the integrate chains and features that are needed from the community, mm -hmm. like layer two, sidechain, and any other uh, extended protocols. Uh, we should also follow up the technologies like touch ID, face ID, sound mm -hmm. ID, uh, which could be integrated into the wireless, like what we have already done. Yeah, and we, we can also open our imaginations that in the future, people don't have to understand whatever kids. They don't have to learn about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, they just, they can, and, and we can believe that the wireless could be part of our body. I, it maybe can be our fingerprint, our face, and other other uh, biomedical measures. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. that's it. That, that that would be interesting in the future if it's just uh, that uh, user friendly, right? So so yeah, Paul. Uh, yeah, if you have anything to add here, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, actually, how can we improve the wallets in general? Not the not my my company's product, but yeah, mm -hmm. but in general. I hate two things about the wallets. Mm -hmm. I actually hate it. Every time I launch my wallet, I hate it more. Uh, the first thing is I don't like the keys. The uh -huh. way they are okay. generated right now, I simply hate it because you need to write down something. There is no proper way to back up and there is nothing you can do about it as a wallet mm -hmm. provider. So there should be some standard about that mm -hmm. and we should make it simpler and we should make it uh, much more convenient for an average user because mm -hmm. today I've explained it to my friend. We had a dinner today and he's from an aviation industry. So he, okay. he's far, far away from that. Mm -hmm. And I tried to explain him what, is, what are the keys, how to, how to back up. And this is almost impossible. He's quite young, but yeah. still the concept is such a such a sophisticated thing uh -huh. that he couldn't understand that I have to spend 30 minutes, but I cannot educate every cu customer for uh -huh. 30 minutes by my own. Oh. That simply won't uh, work. Mm -hmm. So this is the first thing I don't like about the wall. Uh, how can we upgrade the wallets in okay. general is the first thing is to create a new format of the private key, mm -hmm. the, of, of their storage and of their backup. Mm -hmm. And the th second thing is uh, is to create another format of the address. It is impossible mm -hmm. to use the current address. It, it, is, uh, it is some file of uh, numbers and uh, letters which uh, my mom won't understand and I want her to, to be able to transfer me money and me to be able to transfer her money. Okay. So this is also an overcomplicated concept. But here we have a solution with the human readable addresses. And as this is my strong belief that we need to integrate that, we have integrated uh, in Guarda Wallet, we simply mm -hmm. integrated all popular protocols of human readable addresses. Mm -hmm. But what I see right now, we need some kind of an effort from all the wallets to integrate them because otherwise we won't be having uh, a proper solution. And yeah. actually we are decreasing the speed of the 
uh, of the adoption. Uh, so these are two, from my perspective, main uh, goals to upgrade all the wallets. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, guys, for sharing. We look forward to seeing crypto wallets with better functionality and the conveniences. Okay, as you said, said maybe later on in the future, we can just uh, easily remember our address, right? Just like right now, we remember our telephone number or mobile phone number, right? That easy. So we also expect a better decentralized storage service to come. So thank you again for this uh, panel discussion with us. Uh, hope to see you guys soon. Okay, thank you for your time. Our panel uh, later. Yeah. Uh, see you. And thank here. you. That was a pleasure. Bye -bye. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Yeah. So, guys, great for staying with us for this long time. This is a new year where we are embarking on a new stage with new missions. So the product launch for Bitorian X and the integration and innovation within ecosystem Mark Chuan's new departure, which took place in the past, opens up our way to the future. Chuan has been exploring its way forward, so step by step without expecting any quick success. So let's wait and see more innovations and the surprises that Chuan will bring us. Thank you for watching this virtual conference and thank you all for participating in this event with us. So Chuan is waiting for you in the new year. I, with the Chuan team, wish everybody here a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year in advance. So stay tuned and good luck and see you soon. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye.